Greetings and welcome to the 2023 NASMA Annual Biocontrol Summit. My name is Christy Trifone Milhouse, NASMA's Executive Director. We still have folks popping into the webinar, so we'll get going in just a minute. All right, so it looks like most of you are able to get on in, so I'm gonna get, move forward and we'll get the summit started. We have an incredible event planned for all of you today. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to share a bit about NASMA and our mission-driven work. Over 30 years ago, NASMA's founders formed this organization that started as a grassroots movement and grew into an international collaboration focused on supporting invasive species management. NASMA continues to grow by leaps and bounds every year. We currently have over 800 members from all over North America. We are active on many social media platforms and I encourage all of you to find us and follow us. So what do we do? NASMA works to create bridges across geographic divides and jurisdictions. Our programming focuses on three pillars of support, the connection, the voice, the tools. NASMA is the organization that provides a collective voice for our members and the invasive species community as a whole on a national and international scale. There are over 800 of you registered for this summit today. Many of you may not be members. I'd like to encourage all who have not become members to do so. Your membership helps NASMA, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, to continue to provide these trainings from experts in the field to all invasive species managers across North America. In our current membership structure, we have options for individuals and organizations, and we're looking to expand these offerings over the next year, so stay tuned. In the spirit of partnership, I would like to recognize NASMA's very own Classical Biological Control Committee members for their dedication and support in putting together the summit. Special recognition needs to be given to Carol Randall, Joey Milan, Philip Vile, and Jennifer Andres. Finally, I'd like to thank the USDA Forest Service who provided funding for this summit and made it possible for us to offer this free event that is open to the public. It's now time to hand over the mic to NASMA's very own co-chair of the Classical Biological Control Committee, Joey Milan. Before Joey begins, a friendly reminder that if you have a question throughout the summit, post it in the Q&A. If we don't get to any questions, we will follow up after the summit. All right, Joey, time to take it away. Thank you, Christy, and welcome everybody. As Christy mentioned, my name is Joey Milan. I will be uh, moderating the session today. And this session is really meant to look at the nexus between invasive species and biocontrol, where we have some tools available and also where we can build more. I will let the speakers go ahead and tell that story. Our first speaker we are quite pleased to have is uh, Carla D'Antonio. She is a distinguished professor in the Departments of Environmental Studies and Ecology, Evolution and Marine Biology at UCSB. Her interests are in factors driving vegetation change, and the impacts of species invasions. She has worked on the ecology, dynamics, and impacts of invasive species in Hawaii and the Western and the USA. Since 1995, both as an academic researcher and as a federal scientist. Previous positions in three being lead scientist of the Exotic Invasive Weeds Research Unit for the USDA ARS Lab in Reno, Nevada, and working for the Channel Islands National Park on Habitat Restoration. Prior to joining the faculty at UCSB, she was a professor at UC Berkeley. So with that, Carla, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Joey, and thanks to all of you for coming today. So way back in uh, 1992, I proposed that exotic grasses had the potential to transform ecosystems by changing fire regime. And when we put that idea forward, it was based on work I'd been doing in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. But since that time, and there really wasn't much data from around the rest of the world, but since that time, we've had fantastic new tools, remote sensing, GIS, lots of on-the-ground data sets that have 
helped really drive home the fact that the grass fire cycle is real. So the goals of my talk today are to introduce the problem. Who are the <clears throat> some of the culprits? What are the characteristics of grasses that make them so associated with fire? And what are the elements of fire regime that are actually changing as a result of grass invasion? And then I want to present some biology and some ecology as I go through a few examples that will help us talk about the challenges of biocontrol and some of the potentials for biocontrol with grasses. So who are the culprits in the U.S.? There are two main groups. One are the annual grasses. And I'd say some of the worst culprits are in the genus Bromus, cheat grass on top there, red brome and ripgut brome. And then there's other problematic annual species, depending on what part of the country you're in. I'll focus a lot on Bromus tectorum because it's the most well studied of all the species. But then there's a group of perennial grasses that present a different um, bunch of challenges, but maybe some more potential for biocontrol. And some of the worst offenders are buffel grass, Sancris ciliaris, its close relative fountain grass, and Arundo donax, which has changed the function of our riparian zones from barriers to wicks for the spread of fire. There are some woody invaders associated with changing fire regime, mostly tamarack species, but I'm not gonna talk about those at all today because Tom Dudley will cover that later today. So for those of you who don't know that much about grasses, why has there been so much focus on them and why are they associated with fire? So starting with a little basic morphology, they have very thin leaves with a high surface area to volume ratio. And because of that, they can dry out very quickly, um, which is part of their flammability problem. But they also have very dense, shallow roots that are highly competitive for water. And not only does this make them very good at getting water in response to rainfall, it also makes them better often than their nearby competitors, which can contribute to the accumulation of dry fuels in woody shrubs that are adjacent to stands of highly competitive annual or invasive grasses. So they can contribute to the buildup of native fuels through their competition for water. Now, not only do they respond rapidly to rainfall, but they also respond rapidly to drought. So you can get these boom and bust cycles. The top picture shows cheat grass just a few months after it was vibrant and green, but as the summer drought set in, and in the lower picture is buffalo grass, again, after a period of drought with accumulating dead material. So this rapid growth and boom and bust cycling is really important, but also the high silica and carbon to nitrogen ratio of the plant material and the fact that it's held above ground is really critical to making these things so flammable. So they are rapidly drying fuels um, that are highly ignitable. So it's really standing dead material that plays such a critical role in changing fire regimes. Now I emphasize throughout this talk, the focus on fire regime. So you can't just say invasive species are changing fire. You have to really consider what parts of fire regime they're changing. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of the ways that grasses are changing different aspects or elements of fire regime. And I'm gonna focus mostly on Bromus tectorum because this is an incredibly well-studied species now. And in fact, if you Google it, you'll find over 7,000 references in Google Scholar to Bromus tectorum. And some of that is post-fire restoration, but a lot of it is what's happening to the fire cycle. So it's an annual species. It's in the cold desert and this in the Great Basin mostly. And it's a region with high interannual variability in rainfall. And I think that's important when considering the potential for biocontrol. So one of the things that this annual grass does and many of the other annual grass invaders is it changes the seasonality of fire. And it does that by drying out more quickly. So on the y-axis here, you have fuel moisture content 
over time in two different years with cheatgrass in the black dots. And you see that over time, it's drying out much more rapidly than the non-invaded native stands. Now we're seeing the same kind of pattern in California with ripgut brome, Bromus diandris, shown in the orange line here with it crashing in May as we enter our dry season here. And the native fuels in green and blue extending over their keeping their live fuel moisture above this critical threshold. So this change, this drying early in the season can make these species flammable and create a wick for the carrying of fire from places like this roadside into the native vegetation stands. And in fact, cheatgrass has been shown by Bethany Bradley's group to change the seasonality of fire in the Great Basin. So if we look at the percent of fires over different seasons, we see this huge burst around the 4th of July. So the cheatgrass invaded sites are in black and where cheatgrass is absent is in gray. So you see this association of humans and fire ignitions, particularly where cheatgrass has invaded. By contrast, and in fact, 75% of the fires in cheatgrass are ignited by humans. And in the non-cheatgrass invaded areas, we have lightning as a much more important factor in ignitions. So we have plenty of evidence that invasive grasses are changing the seasonality of fire. In terms of return interval, annual grasses appear to promote more frequent fire. And evidence for that comes from uh, a study that Jennifer Balch, myself, and Bethany Bradley did in the Great Basin using different fire perimeter data and asking the question, are the areas dominated by cheatgrass more likely to burn in this time period than areas not dominated by cheatgrass? And Bethany had created a really detailed vegetation map um, of this area. And no matter what source of data you use, you see that the annual probability of fire shown on the y-axis uh, compared to the vegetation type on the x-axis, it's much the higher in cheatgrass than in all the other vegetation types in this region, meaning that you're going to have shorter fire return intervals because of this much higher probability of fire during that interval. Likewise, in California, Alex Seifard and others have looked at the probability of fire occurring in cheatgrass and red brome dominated areas at the edge of our desert. And again, you see on the right here that where these grasses were dominant, the area burned is much higher. So there's a much higher probability of fire occurring in these grassland habitats. And if you look at the map on the left, you see these linear segments of the landscape. Those are highways and this dark purple band around the edge of the or what, sort of the large scale wildland urban interface is the area where we have a lot of nitrogen deposition. So it, again, this ties these invasive species and fire to human activity. Now, in terms of grasses influencing the size and continuity of fire, these data have been a little bit more complicated to get. But if we go back to this study I referenced earlier, we evaluated the largest fires in the data set, and we found that 39 of the fires were in cheatgrass, yet cheatgrass only comprised 6% of the vegetation of the region. So this suggests that cheatgrass is increasing the size of these fires substantially. And the other thing we found was that if we considered only multi-day fires in the data set, 65% of them started in cheatgrass and then spread to other vegetation types. And so this speaks to its ability to create continuity on the landscape and cause larger scale fires. With regards to the way that invasive grasses might be changing intensity and severity of fire, this is actually an area where we have very little data. And in fact, in the Great Basin where fire has been studied so extensively, there's actually little attention to this problem. In California, um, we've been doing some control burning in invaded shrublands and I actually finding that where grasses dominate and you can see some strips of 
grass area that burned at much lower intensity than the adjacent shrubland. So it's possible that although we tend to think of grass as causing fire and that sounds like it would be hot, in fact, I think annual grasses could be lowering the intensity of fire. Now, the last point on my fire regime elements here is could invasive species be changing the type of fire? And I would say that in general, the species I've studied are not changing the type of fire, but in some places, they're actually creating an entirely new disturbance. And this was certainly true where I started this work in Hawaii, but it's also true in the Great Basin that in some parts of that basin, fire is an entirely new disturbance. That's not true in the sagebrush and the pinyon juniper woodlands, but it is true in these uh, air, extremely arid, low desert places, which are quite extensive. And uh, my former postdoc, Karen Havensack, and I surveyed lots of these burned areas almost a decade after fire and found that a single fire in these salt desert communities promoted long-term conversion to cheatgrass and some other unfriendly invaders. So the issues to consider when you think about uh, developing biocontrol strategies is that these annual invaders are crossing a wide range of habitats and there's been scientific evidence that they are genetically diverse as they have invaded these different habitats. There is large year-to-year -year variation in abundance. I don't have time to show you data on that. But I think that, you know, that's an important issue to consider when developing biocontrol agents. There have been some efforts towards microbial sort of herbicides, especially in the post-fire restoration literature, and they do not appear to be successful so far. Okay, I want to quickly also run through a, an example of a perennial grass invader and what these perennial grasses can do. And I've selected buffalo as an example here because it brings up some really interesting and challenging issues. This was a purposefully introduced species. I should say all of those annuals were accidentally introduced. It's a long-lived C4 grass. It's highly drought tolerant and it has really strong boom and bust cycles where it responds quickly to rainfall, grows new biomass, and then dies back very quickly. And it's very, been shown to have a big impact on the mortality and survival of native woody plants independent of fire. But what it's doing relative to fire regime is over here on the right, it's a new type of fire in ecosystems that did not have them. And then in some parts of those deserts, it's really increasing intensity and severity. So here's an example up on the left in the saguaro cactus zone. It's changed. It's brought fire into these ecosystems. The center picture is a picture I took in Sonora, Mexico of a thorn scrub cardone cactus system that's been decimated by fire. And on the right is the city of Lahaina in Hawaii. And this is the primary grass that was present adjacent to the um, area of Lahaina that carried the fire into the urban environment. And I wanna just spend one second talking about that and referencing the work of a student I'm working with at UCSB on land use change in Hawaii, because I think it brings up some important uh, uh, possibilities for biocontrol. Buffalo was purposely introduced to Hawaii for the livestock industry. It is the basis of livestock production in the drier portions of the island. However, Nakoa's work, that's the student I was talking about, on land use change shows that pasture you see in the gray dots here is crashing. The livestock industry is basically pulling out of Hawaii and there are thousands of acres of abandoned pasture land that are full of this flammable, responsive, drought tolerant grass. Likewise, sugarcane and pineapple are disappearing and fire is increasing across this region as these lands are abandoned. So this problem of land abandonment is intimately tied to um, invasive grasses and areas they can dominate. Um, and there aren't any easy solutions. 
people have talked about biocultural restoration, but this is going to be quite challenging and limited in scale, uh, as is dry forest restoration, which I've been involved in a little bit, and it's challenging and quite expensive. People have talked about bringing some cows back and using targeted grazing, and people have talked about that in the Great Basin as well. But having the cows available at the right time is really a big challenge. So I think this is a really important opportunity for biocontrol because then you could have these uh, agents operating across the landscape, a landscape that is going to continue to change as agriculture is abandoned. So in conclusion, annual and perennial grasses are both important in this problem. The affected ecosystems tend to have a very strong seasonality and high interannual variability, and this can result in these boom and bust cycles of fuel accumulation. Finally, I really want to emphasize this connection between grasses, fire, and human activity, and think about how that can help target areas for the development of control strategies. Livestock, although um, grasses are the favorite food of cows, are not a reliable control mechanism. And so really thinking about the potential for biocontrol at the landscape scale is very exciting. And so I thank the organizers with that for organizing a, a, a discussion of this topic. And with that, I thank all of you for listening. Thank you so much, Carla. That's a nice way to kick us off. Um, I, I agree. This is a right, an area ripe for biocontrol investigation. Up next, we have Steve Jarek. Steve has worked for the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Land Management since 1989 with a focus on fire rehabilitation, restoration, fuels, invasive species, and grazing management. He holds a, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Rangeland Ecology and Management from the University of Idaho and has served as the BLM, Idaho BLM's Emergency Fire Rehabilitation and Invasive Species Program lead since 2011. Steve enjoys the outdoors history and family trips and it looks like he's ready to go. So Steve, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks uh, for the introduction, Joey. And thank you, Carla, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation that kind of really sets the stage for what I'm going to visit about this morning. Appreciate the opportunity to visit with you all on the need to expand classical biocontrol's immense potential to passively restore and mitigate our degraded Western landscapes. In the time I have this morning, I'd like to provide a brief history of BLM's revegetation efforts during my 35 years with the agency, discuss why now is an opportune time to encourage expanded classical biocontrol development and then provide my views on why classical biocontrol is not more supportive. And then lastly, suggestion on expanding CBC support. So much of my work over the years has focused on rehabilitating fire damaged areas on the Snake River Plain within the Great Basin, which for decades has been transitioning into invasive annual grasses and noxious wheat dominated landscapes. Our most widespread problematic invasive annual grasses include cheatgrass, medusa head, wild rye, and increasingly ventinata. The Snake River Plain now experiences some of the shortest fire frequencies in North America, as you can see from this map. And of course, it wasn't always that way. Historically, the lower elevations of the Great Basin consisted of scattered sagebrush and salt desert shrubs with perennial bunch grasses and forbs, which resulted in discontinuous fuels and minimal fire occurrence. Biological soil crust occupied the inner spaces between plants. These crusts are important in protecting these communities from weed establishment and soil erosion. Well, beginning in the late 19th century, unregulated livestock grazing began breaking up the crust along cheatgrass establishment undisturbed soils. As the cheatgrass increased, areas became increasingly vulnerable to wildfire, resulting in an ongoing positive feedback loop. It was well understood early that the key to breaking the cheatgrass fire cycle is to replace it with desirable perennial vegetation. And uh, we at BLM have a long history in fire re rehabilitation. 
Our early efforts consisted of drill seeding introduced perennial grasses, typically crest tweak grass after fire. And then in the late 1980s, we were allowed to begin early seeding sagebrush. Most of our earlier fires occurred on intact shrub stands that burned hot enough to create a, a relatively weed-free surface for drill seeding. However, over time, the fires increasingly occurred on previously burned areas, which had few shrubs, resulting in fast, low severity fires that left viable cheatgrass seed on the soil surface, which outcompeted new seedlings. Drought is also common in the Great Basin, and when seedlings would seedings would occasionally fail, they would be taken over by cheatgrass. So at that time, the only way to control annual grass competition was to till it when actively growing and before seeding an area. Not surprisingly, this obliter obliterated the remnant native plants and what remained of the biologic soil crust. And then again, when seedings failed, the sites became totally dominated by invasive annual grasses. So given these difficulties, we just often walked away from these sites, perpetuating the fire cycle. Since that time, we've seen impressive advancements in restoration tools. Foremost are pre-emergent herbicides, which target annual grasses with minimal impacts to desirable vegetation. We now use a mazepic in most fire rehabs to control these grasses before or after seeding. And so nationally, BLM averages about 200,000 acres per year of mazepic applications. And Idaho BLM averages about 58,000 acres. Also when needed, we include additional herbicides such as aminopyrrolid with the mazepic to control broadleaf weed competition. We've also made increasingly available native plant materials that are adapted to our different seed zones, which are made available through seed increase contracts. Lastly, we have advanced seeding implements such as this rugged range master drill, which minimizes ground disturbance while adequately covering the seed. So in the past 30 years, we've made great advances in active restoration. And this is an example of a successful 15-year-old native seeding. However, despite our efforts, we continue losing habitat at an alarming rate, as this map of Southern Idaho's fires in the last 30 years shows. Consequently, the amount of invasive annual cover has increased tremendously throughout the West in a similar 30-year period. So we find ourselves increasingly behind the curve with climate change, fire seasons are getting longer, fires are getting larger, and burning more areas. We can only restore portions of our landscapes. Most are too rugged, too remote, and too degraded, and there will never be enough funding or capacity to actively restore most areas. We're also losing our soils to these larger fires, something that wasn't very common a number of years ago. And then lastly, invasive annual grasses are also expanding into higher elevations. So it's increasingly apparent that our continued reliance only in conventional treatments will not improve most of our degraded landscapes. But we're also at the point where we can't continuing, continue to ignore these vast areas. Continued inaction will only exacerbate their trajectory and result in ever-growing consequences. The good news is that classical biocontrol provides incredible potential to mitigate these vast landscape level issues. And now is an especially opportune time for increased development, given the realization that our biggest environmental problems transcend property boundaries, wildfire, weed proliferation, and most especially climate change. The tremendous role our shrub step communities play in capturing and sequestering carbon is increasingly recognized. For example, Nagy found that in a typical intact sagebrush stand that the above ground carbon stored was about 800 pounds per acre. Even more impressive is the incredible storage within the soil. Maxwell and Germino found that just within the top meter of soil alone, these sites contain over 100,000 pounds per acre of carbon. 
Each ton of carbon stored in the soil removes or maintains about 3.7 tons of carbon dioxide. So when you multiply this out by the 760 million acres of rangelands we have in the US, you get a mind boggling figure of 142 billion tons of carbon dioxide that's sequestered. And what's quite disconcerting is when these areas transition or uh, transform into invasive annual grass communities, the carbon capture and storage is reduced by an incredible 50%. So we can only imagine what planetary implications result from these continuing loss of our sagebrush grasslands. And more specifically, Maxwell, Gemino, and Quick illustrate the amount of carbon storage between vegetation. So when you look at the bottom graph of, the, of a sagebrush stand, as I mentioned, that upper layer includes over 800 pounds per acre, and then the carbon stored within just the first meter of the soil, as I mentioned, is incredible. Also, perennial bunch grasses are incredibly important. They, have, with their extensive robust root systems, they turn over about half of their roots over each year, and so input a lot of organic material into the soil, as we can see. And then, as Carla was mentioning earlier, when you have just an invasive annual grass community with their incredibly shallow root systems, they put very little carbon into the soil and are actually pulling the carbon out. And since many of them burn, then that becomes unfortunately released as carbon dioxide. So our, retire, our desired goal should therefore be a continuum of restoration. We obviously want to continue maintaining our intact hab habitats through EDRR and other preventative mechanisms. And then for our higher value dis um, disturbed areas, we want to continue to restore what is possible through project level treatments. And then importantly, we want to start passively restoring and mitigation our severely degraded landscapes, which we haven't been able to deal with. Uh, this strategy is well summarized by the popular phrase developed by the Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge, which is defend the core, grow the core, and mitigate the impacts. So given CBC's potential and yet dire consequences, if we continue on the same trajectory, one would think CBC development would be well-funded. Astoundingly, it receives little attention and support outside the invasive species community. For example, most uh, CBC scientists and research facilities are located overseas. In the US, we only have four USDA agricultural research station labs working on CBC and six universities with research facilities and CBC focused degrees. BLM is the only agency in the Department of Interior providing financial support for development efforts. I wanna mention that uh, we are fortunate to have support from USDA Agricultural Research Service and Forest Service in particular. And then we also have DOI's only biocontrol specialist. So why is CBC development not better funded? Well, I believe the reason is just simple widespread ignorance. This includes policymakers and surprisingly many biologists and land managers. So it should go without saying that if CBC's huge potential for mitigating our degraded landscapes were better understood, that it would be widely supported. So I guess the next question is why ed otherwise educated individuals are largely unaware of CBC's potential. I have a few theories from my interactions with colleagues over the years. First, it appears that most professionals are familiar with the term biocontrol, but many don't understand exactly what it is and, and view it as a largely theoretical concept. Many confuse classical biocontrol with biopesticides and have been misled by un, uh, unvetted, aggressively marketed products such as weed suppressive bacteria, touted as a silver bullet for the West's cheatgrass problem. Many also draw conclusions from anecdotal observations, such as the bugs I saw in the plant don't really be appear to be controlling this certain weed. So obviously these are one point in time observations that don't consider what the populations would look like without those agents. And they also don't realize that increasing development could result in new agents attacking different plant parts, 
for increased success. B, uh, CBC requires a different mindset. It requires patience and a long-term focus, which goes against our human nature of focusing on finite successes within short time frames. For example, as we drive by that natural wetland, we may forget that it was infested with purple loosestrife just years earlier. And then lastly is the acceptance of a lost battle. CBC exemplifies passive restoration. It requires acceptance that the problematic weed is established and can't be eradicated. And this can be hard to accept. Skeleton weed is a classic example in Idaho, which I think Joey will go into a little later. And so understandably, CBC's complexity requires enhanced outreach. However, CBC has some uniquely attractive selling points, which like a car salesman will tell you sells itself, but people just need to know about it. So first of all, it's natural, it's self-sustaining, it's very cost-effective, and it's just downright fascinating. I've heard various control specialist presentations to diverse groups over the years, and it seems like everyone who hears them comes away being immediate proponents. <clears throat> So people are readily um, attracted to biocontrol. And as an uh, elderly friend of mine from back in the day used to say, they just need to be educated. So the final question is how we improve outreach. We have few biocontrol specialists and our few scientists have their nose to the development grindstone with limited time for outreach. The good news, is that there are many influential land health organizations out there with strong outreach capabilities that we could reasonably engage with to leverage CBC support. The Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge is an example. This effective collaborative campaign led by the Natural Resource Conservation Service focuses on addressing Idaho's invasive annual grass problem. Their popular motto that I mentioned earlier, defend the core, grow the core, mitigate the impacts, is now being widely used by many. However, the Cheatgrass Challenge has focused on EDRR and active restoration, defend the core, grow the core, often dropping the mitigate the impacts verbiage because they, like most everyone else, didn't realize that we can improve our very disturbed areas. With a bit of research or outreach, the Cheatgrass Challenge is now expanding their focus into supporting CBC development. So this is just one example of many influential organizations we can partner with to promote CBC. So like most of us, they just need a little education. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Thanks for the great talk, Steve. Appreciate it. I'll talk about our next presenter and remind folks that we do have a time for more discussion in addition to the Q&A that you guys are kindly putting into Zoom. Up next, we have Dr. Brian Rector, who has worked as a research entomologist for USDA ARS for 24 years. Now he's based at the Invasive Species and Pollinator Health Research Unit in Albany, California. His current research is focused on classical bio biological control of invasive annual grasses in the Western USA, including the discovery and identification of their natural enemies and evaluation to assess their suitability for importation into the USA as biocontrol agents. Dr. Rector holds a PhD from the University of Georgia and has published 67 peer-reviewed articles in the diverse fields of entomology, acerology, taxonomy, plant pathology, plant and arthropod physiology, agriculture, agronomy, ecology, evolution, molecular genetics, genetic pest management, and biological control. In addition to his working relationships with stakeholders in the Western USA, Dr. Rector has active collaborations with scientists from Bulgaria, excuse me, Bulgaria, France, Italy, Poland, and Serbia. Most evenings, he can be found listening to Boston Red Sox or Bruins games on internet radio. It looks like he's ready to go. So Brian, go ahead and take a look. As uh, Joey mentioned, my name is Brian Rector. I uh, work for USDA ARS in Albany, California, and I primarily work on research on biological control of invasive grasses. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm mainly going to be talking about cheatgrass and medusa head, but here are the grasses that we focus on 
in uh, our USDA biocontrol program. It's cheatgrass, a red brome, very close relative, medusa head, and wiregrass are our main targets. And they have become important targets uh, for management due to their association with recent increases in the frequency and magnitude of wildfires in the West, as Professor D'Antonio pointed out earlier. I'd like to begin with an overview of classical biological control of weeds represented in this timeline. You begin by studying the biology and ecology of your targets. Then you go to their native range to find their co-evolved natural enemies. You test those natural enemies, typically beginning in laboratories of in-country collaborators in their native ranges to identify the natural enemies that eat only your target weed and cause sufficient damage to reduce their populations in the invaded range. You learn how to rear these biocontrol candidate agents in large numbers and complete your pre-release testing in a quarantine laboratory in America, of which we have one in Albany. Sometimes you include some field cage testing in the invaded range with permitting. If your results are promising, you can petition for release of your agent and if a permit is granted, you, you make releases and monitor their effects. And then you may also work with stakeholders on post-release restoration. This map shows the approximate native ranges of our target species. There's cheatgrass in yellow, which has the largest native range among the species. Medusa head and red brome are mainly concentrated around the Mediterranean uh, ecosystem and Wiregrass has a, a little bit more northern range. And this is where we are searching for our natural enemies of these invasive grasses. So when you're searching for natural enemies of your targeted weeds, first you have to find the plants. They are often quite rare in their native ranges. So it's useful to visit herbaria in the countries where you plan to search. These should contain local records of your targeted species and collections. And those will tell you where they were found and where they were collected, however, many years ago. It's essential to establish in-country contacts who can provide invaluable local knowledge and logistical support, such as where to find a good herbarium. And in the field, you need to be aware of closely related lookalike species that you may have never seen in America. They tend to be more common over in the native range than in the invaded range. They may have never invaded America, the lookalikes. The more you see your targets in the field, the more you learn about their preferred habitats. And then you can look for similar habitats in the native range to find your plant and its natural enemies. For example, we know that Medusa head favors clay soils. So we can look at a soils map like this one of Spain and Portugal and overlay climate information like th these circles that I drew on this map representing matches to the climate of the Great Basin, where many of our target grasses are invasive. And we should have a, a good chance of finding Medusa head in the yellow areas, which represent clay soils, within the circles which represent the Great Basin climate match on this map. To find cheatgrass, by contrast, we would look for mountainous areas that are likely to have exposed bedrock and shallow soils, which is a habitat that we have found in the native range to be the most common habitat for cheatgrass. It's also important to look for sympatric plants in the native range that are frequently found cohabitating with your targeted plants. They may be easier to see, for example, from the road as you're driving by, especially for annual grasses when you are looking for a few cheatgrass plants that are not very common in their native range. You may miss them as you're driving by, but if there's a, a plant with a showy flower that also grows in the same habitat as cheatgrass, that might be something that you'd be easier to see. So this map shows a summary of where we have searched for na natural enemies to our invasive annual grasses to date in the purple shaded areas. I hope those show up. Uh, the white stars show where we have in-country collaborators. 
you'll notice that we lost several years of field work in the title of this slide. We lost several years of field work due to pandemic related travel restrictions. And without any further ado, I'll give you a summary of the natural enemies that we found to date on cheatgrass. This map shows where they have been found. Um, many of them in the Balkan region uh, where all the stars are concentrated, but also uh, in Armenia where the gray star is. There's a mite, the yellow stars. There's two midges, two different shades of blue. There's a weevil, the dark red. There's two pathogens, the orange and the gray stars. So the cheatgrass mite is a tiny beast that is found on the surface of the plant but it migrates to the seed when the plant senesces. It doesn't cause obvious damage to the plant, so we're currently trying to determine if it has an effect on germination since it migrates to the seed uh, when the, the plant dries down. We are wondering if the mites will feed on the seed while they're waiting for it to germinate, and if so, perhaps it causes enough feeding to prevent the seed from germinating. The cheatgrass seed midge is a close relative of a midge that attacks smooth brome, which is another forage grass that was in intentionally introduced mostly in the Great Plains in the Midwest in the 20th century, much like buffalo grass uh, was introduced into Hawaii, as Dr. D'Antonio mentioned earlier. So we have a fair amount of biological information for the relative of the cheatgrass midge. The cheatgrass midge was a new species that we discovered uh, a few years ago. The larvae of this midge attach by the mouth to the part of the flower of cheatgrass where the seed would grow. And then it consumes the nutrients that would otherwise produce a seed. So instead of a seed, the flower produces a grown midge. Each larva replaces one seed, but you can have a, a large number of uh, larvae on a single cheatgrass plant, affecting most of the seeds that would have been there. And it's also possible to have more than one generation uh, in the same year, depending on the conditions of that year. The cheatgrass crown midge is a close relative of the hessian fly, and it appears to cause important damage. It prevents uh, stems from growing, as you can see this stem on the right next to the stem that did grow. We first collected this insect last spring, but we were unable to rear any adult specimens that are necessary for precise taxonomic identification. This species of midge was described many years ago from cheatgrass, and we believe that this is the same species. And we have found a, a site that was not previously noted. So obviously if the stem is stunted like the one in this photo, uh, you wouldn't have any seeds uh, produced from that stem. The cheatgrass seed weevil is a close relative of a minor pest of some cereals. We searched uh, wheat fields near where the weevil larvae were collected from cheatgrass seeds, but we didn't find any weevil larvae in, in wheat seeds. So this is a little bit of anecdotal evidence that the same weevil is not attacking also wheat and maybe specific to cheatgrass. We've collected the larvae out of the seeds and we've also collected adults on on cheatgrass plants and match them using DNA fingerprinting. But we, we need more uh, specimens of adults because it's very difficult to morphologically separate uh, taxonomically this weevil from the pest weevil. And so we're working with a weevil taxonomist to do this since the DNA fingerprinting shows that they appear to be different species. The cheatgrass rust is another new discovery found this past spring in Northern Greece. Rusts are often highly specific to their hosts and there have, has never been a rust recorded from cheatgrass. Several rusts have been released as biocontrol agents on other weeds, sometimes with spectacular results. We uh, sent the samples that we collected of this rust to the USDA ARS uh, pathogen biocontrol unit in uh, Maryland for further analysis, as we do not specialize in pathogens uh, in our lab in Albany, mostly on insects. Another pathogen causing these black streaks was also collected this past spring on cheatgrass, this time in Armenia. And we also sent those samples to the 
Pathogen Biocontrol Lab in Maryland. On Medusa Head, there have only been two natural enemies collected thus far, a mite and a seed galling wasp. And we are beginning to rethink our uh, search uh, practices for natural enemies of Medusa Head uh, and perhaps shifting some of the search to the fall when the Medusa Head is in the seedling stage. Uh, but to date, we've been searching in the spring and looking for natural enemies on seeds and, and ma mature plants, which as you can see, we haven't found very many thus far. The Medusa Head wasp causes very promising damage. However, it was discovered very close to the border between Greece and Turkey, who are not very friendly with each other. It's not a very easy place to do field work that involves wandering through fields and along roadsides and occasionally getting down on your hands and knees. So we will need to find additional populations of this compelling insect in order to be able to make reg regular field collections necessary for establishing and maintaining laboratory colonies for testing. But as you can see from the photo, it, the, the damage uh, looks very promising. The Medusa head mite is a close relative of the cheatgrass mite, and we are conducting similar studies on it to determine if it affects seed germination, just as we are with the cheatgrass mite. It's a vagrant mite, which means that it's on the surface of the plant and does not produce galls. And as I mentioned, like the cheatgrass mite, we, it, we haven't seen obvious damage, and so we are going to look at germination studies. We have also collected a small number of this Medusa head mite from a Medusa head infestation in Northeastern California. So it appears to have been accidentally introduced uh, probably with one of the uh, introductions of Medusa head itself, since the mite, uh, like the cheatgrass mite, crawls up to the seed when the plant dries down and may have been introduced with Medusa head seed years ago. However, we haven't been able to find the mite in California or in several other nearby states since that first discovery. So because of that, we're currently developing an eDNA protocol to try to improve our collection efficiency. Returning to our biocontrol timeline, you can see that we are still at early stages for all of our invasive annual grass targets. With most of the progress on cheatgrass and also Medusa head. We haven't collected any insects directly from red brome, but it is a very close relative of cheatgrass and we will be testing all of our cheatgrass candidates also on red brome. We've only recently begun work on wiregrass with most of this work done in the invaded range uh, in the Western US. The green arrow on the right indicates our discovery of the Medusa head mite in California. And if we can find more of those, we could try to gather empirical data on whether it is affecting invasive Medusa head populations. For the coming year, we need to focus on establishing laboratory colonies of the insects we've discovered, which will require returning to the native range field sites at the best times for collecting these species. And also with our cooperators and our own quarantine laboratory, we'll need to be prepared to receive those insects and begin laboratory colonies. With that, I'd like to thank all the people who contribute to this work, including our stakeholders who support our travel and labor listed at the bottom. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the group. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And actually it is now time for questions. So if we could have uh, Carla and Steve pop on for any questions. We're a little bit behind time, but um, we did build in a couple of those buffers thinking that we might do that. For the next uh, 15 minutes or so until we have Michelle hop on, we have an open time for questions. We did have a number of questions come up in the Q&A and thank you folks for putting those in the Q&A and not the chat. But if there are any other questions that we can address besides those, we will certainly do that. I don't see any questions uh, popping up in the Q&A. So I will reiterate that these presentations will all be available on NASMA's YouTube channel. In addition to that, we have a number of products that we are rolling out on the Biocontrol 101 course. If you have any questions about the ins and outs of biocontrol, there are six sessions that you can go through to get a biocontrol certification. That's live and at no cost on NASMA's website. We also have uh, a bunch of biocontrol fact sheets that look at the 
target weed and also the biocontrol agents associated with those target weeds. I believe we've got 26 online right now with several more in the docket at various stages of production. Uh, we're hoping to have those ready to go um, in the near future. It's a labor of love for a lot of us that are doing it on the side. Um, Carla, I see a hand up. Go ahead. Okay, this is a question for Brian because I don't really know anything at all about this Hessian fly, but this cheatgrass crown midge sounded kind of intriguing. And you said it was related to this well studied Hessian fly. So, can you tell me is this Hessian fly a successful biocontrol agent somewhere? And if this thing is related to it, does that give you optimism that? this could be a good agent or not? Well, Carla, it's nice to hear your voice. The Hessian fly is a very serious pest of wheat. And being a very serious pest of wheat, it has a, obviously a very great impact on its host plant. So that gives us a little bit of hope, I suppose, that its close relative on cheatgrass might, once we study it further, might show that it has a really important impact. As you can see here in the photo, we see that it's really stunting this particular stem, but we don't know if the plant compensates by sending out additional stems. So that's uh -huh. something that we'll have to, to study. But like I said, given that its close relative is a real economic pest, one of the real uh, classic economic pests of wheat, it gives us hope that we could have a similar impact. And this is indeed one of our darling potential agents, even if we've only found it this spring, because it, it does appear to, to have a big impact. And it, it also appears that it might be relatively easy to rear <clears throat> and study that way. Great. Thank you for that. And Carly, you do have a question in the chat. I guess we can answer that live. Um, the question is, could you talk a little more about your comment on a rondo biocontrol wasp potentially oh. causing extra fire <laughs> Okay, that was a comment I made in the chat, so I don't yeah. know that uh, the general audience has seen it. But the question was, is there successful biocontrol for Arundo yet? And uh, there are. there is one agent that w was released in Texas, but it was found uh, by Tom Dudley in California and naturally prior to even being released. And in our region, it's the same uh, wasp species. It seems to promote a proliferation of small lateral branches of the Arundo. Um, it might reduce the height of the plant, but it's still pretty tall and a lot of fuel. And by creating a lot of small side branches, it has the potential to actually make the plant more flashy as a fuel, you know, it could dry out more readily and have a lot more of these thin, small, dead-ish or dying side branches. So I think before we go too far with some of these agents, we need to explore if they're not killing the plant right out, what are they doing to that plant in terms of its fuel characteristics? And what might that translate into in terms of ignitability and fire spread at the landscape scale? So that was my comment. Does that answer the question of whoever asked this? That was Paul Heimowitz, and I'm not sure if attendees have access to turn their mic on, so I'll wait to hear. Oh. You also have a question in the chat while we wait for Paul's response. I wanted to uh, just follow up on what Carla just said, that there are actually several Rondo biocontrol agents that have been released, and uh, some of them are having pretty good effects. The tillering uh, effect that Carla mentioned is kind of a two-edged sword, um, and, and I'm speaking uh, as the colleague of the scientist in ARS, Patrick Moran, who is currently heading up the uh, U.S. Arundo uh, biocontrol program in our lab in Albany. His office is actually just next door to mine. And that the Arundo biocontrol program was begun by uh, uh, John Goolsby, who works in ARS in South Texas. I mentioned the double-edged sword of that particular agent. One of the mandates for biocontrol of Arundo was actually to lower the height of the plant or you know reduce stands so that these tall plants along the Rio Grande 
could not hide migrants that were coming up across the, the Rio Grande. So there was a lot of funding for that project that came from the Department of Homeland Security. So that's a sort of side issue, but there are several Rondo biocontrol agents that have been released. And I would uh, encourage anybody who's interested in Arundo biocontrol to contact Dr. Patrick Moran from in Albany. And Brian, you're probably best to answer this question. Is the Mitch for smooth brown being developed as a biocontrol agent? Actually, the Mitch on smooth brome is very present in North America. And in fact, one of the reasons why there's so much biological information about it, and it's really a fascinating biological system. I wish I could go into detail about it, but smooth brome was a crop in the middle of the 20th century and tons and tons of smooth brome seed were produced in the Great Plains area for distribution as forage to grow forage across, I think mostly the Western U.S., but maybe even other parts of the U.S. The smooth brome midge was a pest and this is why it was studied so much. There's a lot of biological information that was generated from the University of Nebraska and also some researchers in Russia where it may be the origin of that midge. So it's already released, quote unquote. It's already very present in the area where smooth brome is now invasive in the U.S. So I guess whatever control potential it has, it's already uh, showing. Thank you, Brian. And while we kind of wind down our break here, um, there is a question for the panel at large, and that is, if we end up with successful biocontrol agents for cheatgrass, have we thought about concurrent restoration activities needed due to its ubiquitous presence across the West? I'd say that's a question for Steve, because they have so many different kinds of approaches to restoration now that, to me, it seems ideal to integrate biocontrol with some of these other restoration activities. I mean, it differs so much between site potential, how severely disturbed the area was. Uh, I, I guess the way I envision successful biocontrol efforts in these severely degraded areas is it has that classical um, graph shows that I'm sure most of us have seen. I didn't get to have it up there too long. With biocontrol, you're still maintaining those problematic species, but hopefully at a much more uh, lower level. And so, you know, that would be one form. A lot of these areas we can't do a whole lot on anymore. If we could at least reduce those invasives at a much lower level, then that would be form of passive restoration. But depending on the site, there's all sorts of different tools in the toolbox. And one of the things I wanted to mention is there's additional new herbicides, such as indazaflam, which has good potential, has kind of a sprain release type treatment where you could get longer control. There's just a whole lot of options out there for the specific site one might happen to be dealing with. I know that's not a real specific answer, but <laughs> that's about the best I can do on that. Yeah, and I think to round out what Steve just said, we do have a lot of restoration activities that we've been working with at the BLM for a number of years. So we do have some options, but they're all very site-specific. That restoration component is one that's usually lacking, and there's a lag behind, but I think with cheatgrass, we're uniquely positioned to kind of move in the direction of utilizing the tools that we already have. Joey, I would add to that there's weeds that might come in after cheatgrass if we had a successful biocontrol for cheatgrass and we're cognizant of those, for example, tumbleweeds and other weeds that uh, might replace cheatgrass if cheatgrass uh, was controlled. And we're also studying biocontrols of, of some of those because there are already weeds in, in many places, but also because maybe they could get a boost if cheatgrass was no longer there. Yeah, you'll about. Well, I was going to say, Brian, in, in uh, those salt desert sites that we studied that were burned in cheatgrass field fires, uh, tumbleweed was one of the big invaders. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, livestock actually like tumbleweed and it has pretty high protein value. I don't know if they like it, but they, it has high protein content and is a forage species, but it would be good to get biocontrol agents lined up so that 
um, the secondary weeds don't just take over. Okay, in the interest of time, we're going to move on, but uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for the first um, slate of speakers. Um, we do have a discussion session set aside at the end of the, the summit as well, but I do want to introduce uh, Michelle Christ. Uh, throughout her career, Michelle has been heavily involved in ecological research and modeling in the disciplines of landscape ecology, as well as wildfire, fire, forest, and sagebrush ecology, climate change, and invasive species management. In her current position as a landscape ecologist for the BLM Fire Planning and Fuels Management Division, she leads the development, coordination, and application of science. She has produced national fire risk assessments and several interagency geospatial assessments and frameworks used in large-scale prioritization and management of fire risk, vegetation restoration, and invasive annual grasses that have a negative influence on wildfire. She has led interagency teams to develop tools, guidance documents, and large-scale frameworks for wildland fire and natural resource management. She also collaborates with USGS, U.S. Forest Service, universities, and other organizations on research projects that inform fire planning and fields management to help reduce uncharacteristic fire at national and regional scales. And Michelle, you are up and look good in presenter form. Go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, Joey. As Joey mentioned, I'm Michelle Christ. I'm a landscape ecologist with BLM Fire and Aviation, and I'm based at the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. And so I'm going to speak broadly about non-native plant invasions and altered fire regimes. And then I'll just talk about a work um, that's been coordinated by a federal agency work group called the NISC WIFLIC Partnership and everything that they are doing to help address invasive species and wildland fire management, especially this whole conundrum here. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Stash Virgil, who's the executive director with the National Invasive Species Council, and Mike Zupko, who's the chair of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council. So invasive species are altering the timing, frequency, and severity of fires um, across the nation. And invasive plants do this by increasing the available fuel in native ecosystems, and they change fuel properties by making the ecosystems either more fire prone or less fire prone. They can have a strong influence on fire size by creating more of that horizontal as well as this vertical fuel continuity. They increase fire intensity uh, due to the larger fuel loads and they can either increase or decrease fire frequency. And more often than not, invasive plant presence increases after a fire. For example, um, invasive plants such as fire-prone non-native grasses that are shown here in the red circle in the photo at the very top, they invade native ecosystems and they dry out early before the fire season begins. And these grasses provide a continuous fine fuel that ignite easily and then increase fire occurrence and spread. And so after fire, invasive grasses rapidly recover, outcompeting native species, while native species like sagebrush or saguaro cacti don't recover and eventually just disappear across the landscape. And so the result is just this high rates of conversion of NATO ecosystems to non-native grassland communities that just continue to spread across landscapes and promote frequent fire. So it's this positive feedback loop that's creating this invasive grass fire cycle that we are seeing today. So there are two challenges for invasive plant and wildland fire management. Um, first, wildfires and wildfire suppression operations can increase the risk of introduction and the spread of invasive plants. Um, second, fuels management is often timber-centric with less focus on managing for invasive plants. So these graphics here um, illustrate the scope and scale of an invasive grass and wildfire issue for the Western United States. 
Uh, the figure on the left was developed by Jones et al. in 2019, and it depicts an 800% increase in the distribution and cover of invasive grasses from 9 to 2018 due to warmer temperatures and weather patterns. The spread and in interaction with fire has created these large expanses of monocultures of invasive grasses. And these grasses are now expanding into higher elevations and in forested areas. And if it, they continue unabated, um, they will likely change fire regimes in these areas as well. The figure on the right represents the change in the proportion of shrubland and grassland over a hundred year period. The picture at the very top was taken in 1901 and the picture in the middle was taken in the same spot in 2008. Now it's just an invasive grass monoculture. And the graph at the bottom shows the proportion of shrubland versus grassland over the past 12,000 years and how much that proportion has changed since European settlement, which you can see all the way at the very right-hand side of that graph. Well, focus is often on the West when it comes to wildfire and invasives. This is a national level issue with many invasive plants that affect fire cycles occurring in the Midwest, the Northeast and Southeast uh, for both non-forested and forested ecosystems. For example, there is red brome in the Mojave Desert, Phragmites in Michigan and the Northeast. There's guinea grass in Hawaii, buffalo grass in the Southwest, Kogan grass in the Southeast, and we're all familiar with the cheatgrass in the interior west. So these invasive plants are often regionally specific. They have different biogeographic dynamics and they're managed by different agencies, which make it much more challenging to address this issue. So this invasive plant wildfire cycle is occurring at a national scale. And this graph here depicts results from a paper I just recently published in the Journal of Environmental Management, where I compared area burned by vegetation type. So forest tree dominated is shown in green in, in the graph and non-forest, uh, more of your shrub herbaceous communities um, are shown in orange. And so the results show that more area burned on non-forested lands than on forested lands over the past two decades. And for the counter menace US, 54% of area burned occurred on non-forested lands and 46% occurred on forested lands. I found uh, similar trends for in, when I just looked at the Western US as well. So these results were surprising given that a majority of these non-forest ecosystems historically burned relatively infrequently. In addition, results highlight challenges with current wildland fire legislation that focus mainly on forest fire management. These graphics here uh, depict results from a spatial fire regime departure analysis that I conducted for the same paper. And the graphic on the left depicts where non-forested lands shown in orange and forested lands that are shown in green are experiencing more frequent fire compared to historical wildfire trends. And so these results showed that there was a 74% of area with increased fire frequencies were non-forested vegetation types. The top three types with increased fire cycles were big basin, sagebrush, shrubland, and steppe, introduced annual grasses, and desert scrub. And these analyses also correlate well with invasive grass spatial distribution that's shown in the figure inset. And this information can be used to determine where coordination between wildland fire and invasive species management can help address these uncharacteristic fire cycles. Climate change also has a strong effect on the interaction between invasive plants and wildfire cycles, um, especially from what we've seen with uh, sagebrush dominated lands. And so this research here uh, was conducted by John Bradford at USGS. And it offers a great example of the large scale effects of invasive plants and wildfire on our native ecosystems. 
The figure on the left shows that under sort of that business as usual climate change scenario, climate change has modest impacts to sagebrush with increases shown in blue and decreases that are shown in red. However, shown in the figure on the right, when climate change interacts with the spread of invasive grasses, which accelerate fire cycles, sagebrush declines are more widespread and severe, including areas where invasion was not a major problem historically. Loss of sagebrush is shown in red, and then the blue highlights areas of, of sagebrush increase. Uh, these results just highlight the importance of addressing the invasive grass wildfire cycles that are occurring across the entire United States. Recognizing the growing severity of this invasive plant and wildfire issue, in 2020, the National Invasive Species Council and the Wildland Fire Leadership Council that represents federal fire management departments and agencies, as well as state, tribal nations, and local government officials, formed a partnership to identify goals and opportunities for more coordination to help leverage federal actions across the wildland fire and invasive species communities and build collaboration and engagement with non-federal partners. So this partnership was incorporated into uh, NISC annual work plans, and it was incorporated within WIFLIC's strategic priorities. Uh, the partnership is supported by a federal interagency task team, um, including the Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, Department of Defense, and the Department of Commerce. The NISC WIFLIC task team identified a set of 13 opportunities that can advance interagency coordination between wildland fire and invasive species management. And a co-chair's departmental memo for integrating and coordinating wildland fire and invasive species management efforts was developed around these opportunities and was published in 2022. The 13 opportunities in the memo cover three areas of wildland fire management where more integration with invasive species management is needed. And this includes pre-fire management activities such as field management and fire planning, wildfire suppression operations and response, and wildfire recovery and restoration. In addition, the team identified cross-cutting focal areas that would help improve invasive species and wildland fire management coordination, such as funding streams, information and data management, and research and development. And so this slide highlights some emerging needs that this um, task team has learned so far from the partners and is potentially where biocontrol methods can be included. So at the national level, there are needs um, for developing a spatial invasive plant distribution data sets, linkages to relevant agency programs and strategies, such as the native seed strategy or the national wildland fire cohesive strategy, um, assessment of invasive plant controls in fields management for reducing wildfire risk, um, development and application of performance metrics and engagement with non-federal partners. And then at the regional level, some emerging needs included the identification and development of spatial invasive species data sets for risk mapping, development and application of spatial mapping tools to target interventions, and development of invasive plant and fire behavior models, as well as integration of regional prioritization efforts and climate considerations. And so this graphic here is an example of a developing framework for prioritizing invasive plant and wildland fire management. And the areas that are shown in pink are the relatively uninvaded, more intact areas. And here we can apply management strategies such as early detection and rapid response and monitoring. And then the areas that are shown in blue here are more of our restoration areas. And here we can coordinate strategic prevention, control, and eradication of invasive fields, such as biocontrol could potentially be used here. Um, we can increase our firefighting capacity in rural areas and um, also do more monitoring as well. 
Um, and in the gray areas that are shown here, these are your heavily invaded areas. And this is where your mitigation strategies um, should come into play. And here we could focus on reducing transmission of wildfire uh, to intact and restored areas. Um, these areas are great for and high priority siting for fuel treatments, such as fuel breaks. And we can also focus on wildfire prevention and mitigation efforts here. And lastly, the team is working on invasive plant and wildfire research, which is one of the opportunities that was highlighted in the memo. And this includes first identifying all entities that are conducting invasive species and wildland fire research. Uh, second, um, we are working with funders of research, such as the Joint Fire Sciences Program, to fund several research themes on invasive plants and wildfire for their annual request for proposals. And third, we're writing a state of the science book that will be published through Springer. And the lead editor of the book is Matt Brooks with USGS. And the authors will review all existing knowledge on invasive plants and wildfire interactions. And I think this book will most likely be published about next year. And with that, I will end here and just say thank you very much for listening and like to give a special thanks to the NISC WIFLIC Interagency Task Team. And if you have any questions, um, here's my contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was a, a great uh, overview of everything that's happening in the wildfire realm. And uh, obviously that really dovetails nicely into what we're working on in the biocontrol community. Uh, with that, we'll move to uh, Carol Randall. Carol is the uh, USDA Forest Service Northern International Intermountain Region Forest Health Protection Pesticide Use Coordinator, Invasive Plant Program Manager, and Lead Biological Control Specialist stationed in the United States. She has worked with Western land managers to increase the use and monitoring of biological control as a key component of integrated weed management strategies. She is a passionate advocate for the meaningful incorporation of weed biological control into weed management strategies that help reduce wildfire risk and promote ecological resilience. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to hear all the presenters um, beforehand because these, these talks really do complement each other. I work for the USDA Forest Service, and I wanted to really focus in on weed biocontrol and the fact that it really can be an ally in wildfire risk reduction activities in the wild and urban interface. And so I wanted to start out with this report that came out in February of this year um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and this is the AR6 synthesis report that summarizes the state of knowledge of climate change, its widespread impacts and risks, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. And it's a very long report, but in this slide, in the observed impacts and related losses and damage of climate change section, the AR6 report found that climate change was going to have adverse impacts on heat, malnutrition, and harm from wildfire across the world. And as you can see, if you read the scales, definite adverse effects with everywhere, depending on which region of the globe you're coming from, from a medium to a high or very high confidence level. So with that in mind, one of the reports that the AR6 drew on was the United Nations Environmental Program study from February of 2022 that found that wildfires could increase by 50% this century and concluded that climate change and land use changes are making wildfires worse. And the authors expect that the changes will result in an increase worldwide of extreme wildfires. The study also found that the management of invasive alien vegetation is crucial for the prevention of extreme wildfires. In January of 2022, the USDA Forest Service announced <clears throat> the 10-year initiative confronting the wildfire crisis, a strategy for preventing communities and improving resilience in Americans' forests. And the Initiative calls for a paradigm shift in land management to increase fuels and forest health treatments across jurisdictions to match the scale of wildfire risk, especially in the Western United States. In recent years, national forests have treated two to three million acres per year for fuels and forest health across the nation. 
This 10-year Forest Service initiative calls for dramatically increasing fuels and forest health treatments. It anticipates an additional 20 million acres of national forest system lands will be treated over 10 years. And while the treatments in the east will remain at or slightly above current treatment levels, treatments in part of the west will be up to four times the current treatment levels. The strategy also calls for the Forest Service to work with partners to treat up to an additional 30 million acres of other federal, state, tribal, and private lands over the next 10 years, and to develop a plan for long-term maintenance of treatments beyond the 10-year initiative. Work is going to be conducted in fire sheds, which are large, an average of 250,000 acre forested landscapes, with a high likelihood that an ignition could expose homes, communities, and infrastructure to wildfire. Fire adapted conditions should be restored on 35 to 45% of a fire shed through a range of fuels and forest management activities. And one of the key features of the strategy is followed by maintenance treatments at intervals of 10 to 15 years. So for the next 10 years, the focus is on getting the fire sheds in better resilience and then Additional emphasis is gonna be put on in subsequent years to make sure that the treatments are maintained. So the Wildland Urban Interface, or the WUI, it's the area in which human settlements either abut or intermingle with natural or semi-natural landscapes. Federal policies in the US strongly emphasize reducing hazardous fuels at the Wildland Urban Interface. But WUI presents restoration challenges as they often have exotic weeds frequent human disturbance, and the presence of roads. So understanding seed banks in the WUI is important. While above ground exotic and noxious plant species are largely restricted to roadsides in forested wildland urban interface, the forest vegetation doesn't act as a good barrier for the penetration of weedy species seeds. So researchers have found that when they take seed bank samples from the interior forested areas in the WUI, those soil samples had similar exotic and noxious species germinant densities and richness as seed bank samples from the weedy roadside areas. So when fuels or forest health treatments disturb the soil in the wildland urban interface away from the roadsides where the weeds were less abundant, the weed seeds were waiting in the seed bank to germinate and the weeds often would subsequently dominate treated sites. So before wildfires, weeds can be fuel. After wildfires, weeds can spread, and fuels and forest health treatments can exacerbate existing and create new weed problems. An integrated approach to addressing current and preventing future weed populations is vital when disturbance and management activities increase across the landscapes. So invasive species management, keys to success. In monitoring, evaluating, and reporting, Identify the weed species that may become a problem and look for them. When the weeds are found, map their location and evaluate the scope of the problem and let others know what you are dealing with on your lands. In research and development, research the weeds you have and the weeds that occur on adjacent lands and develop a response strategy to enable a rapid response to new invaders and increase the likelihood of success for addressing weeds you already have. Understand at what stage of invasion your weed population lands. If you're in a prevention and preparedness mode, these are the weeds that you don't have yet. And in prevention and preparedness, you're focused on learning how to identify and eradicate potential invaders and detecting new invaders quickly by consistently monitoring and ensuring your vegetative community is healthy and resilient. At the eradication stage, this is when you find a new population of a weed species and the focus is to get rid of it. Once you get to the containment stage, this is where your population of a particular weed is too extensive to allow for quick eradication, but you still have options in being able to contain the weed to as small an area as possible and preventing the weed from expanding into uninfested areas. And finally, at asset-based protection, this is when the population of a weed is widespread and cannot be contained, and your management activities focus on managing weed populations, which pose the most significant risks to assets you want to protect. In an appropriate management response, you wanna treat the problem you have in the most economical and environmentally friendly way 
that allows you to reach your land management goals. So if you are successful in the prevention and preparedness efforts, your invasive species management resources will be allocated primarily to monitoring, evaluating, and reporting and research and development. If not, your resources need to broaden to include more control tactics and an integrated pest management strategy. So here is a figure of the classic invasion curve. And the invasion curve is a useful conceptual model to divide the invasion process into the four distinct management phases based on the size and distribution of the invasive species population. We talked about prevention, you know, before the weeds are there, eradication when you've got a few of them and you can get rid of them, containment where they're not everywhere, but they're pretty dense in some areas. So your focus is on keeping them where they are and stopping them from getting everywhere else. And then asset-based protection where the weeds are pretty much everywhere and you're focusing your treatment on areas where those populations are affecting what you want to get out of your land management program. So if you overlay your management objectives onto the invasion curve, prevention, you're trying to keep those invaders out, eradication, you're trying to find them quickly and eradicate them. By the time you get to the containment and the asset-based protection stages of the invasion curve, you're wanting to maintain these at low levels. And we've been talking about biological control. And one interesting thing about classical biocontrol is it's not an effective strategy throughout the invasion curve. Classical biocontrol becomes a realistic option when you are at that containment stage and into that asset-based protection stage. Because one thing about classical biocontrol that we know for certain is that it will not eradicate your target weed. So classical biocontrol of weeds is directed against plants that invade areas outside their normal distribution range by introducing natural enemies from the native range of the plant with the objective to reduce and permanently stabilize the density of the invasive plants, not eradicate, reduce and stabilize. The natural enemies or biocontrol agents are expected to multiply and disperse by themselves. And before we will introduce a particular weed biocontrol agent, we are going to demonstrate that it has a narrow host range. So these are host specific biocontrol agents. And another thing that tends to get lost in the discussion around biocontrol is when we're talking about classical biocontrol agents, we're talking about a suite of control agents that are regulated by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to ensure that they are appropriately vetted before they are introduced into the United States. And even once they're here, it requires an interstate transport permit to move these biocontrol agents across state lines. So Van Dreyschedal in the 2010 paper, Classical Biocontrol for the Protection of Natural Ecosystems, concluded that for landscape level suppression or prevention of emerging damage from an expanding invasion, classical biological control should be considered because if successful, it brings about desired ecological change over large areas without repeated costs or treatments of the entire infested areas. The Forest Service 10-year initiative focuses on managing large 250,000 acre plus fire sheds, which is an ideal scale for implementing weed biocontrol. So what is the current status of weed biocontrol? It's been implemented on several noxious weed systems over the past decades. However, post-release monitoring has been lax. Weed biocontrol impacts are often unrecognized, but with increased focus on weed biocontrol monitoring and implementation, we are discovering that biocontrol agents act as a bulwark against more significant weed problems precipitated by disturbance and management. Adding new biocontrol systems like invasive grasses requires additional investments and regulatory attention. So I'm gonna pause now and talk about a case study that demonstrates why monitoring matters. And this case study is based on a paper that was um, published by Smith et al. in 2021 on a, on a Dalmatian toad flax infested site in California, which had been studied since about 2005 to document the impacts of the Dalmatian toad flax stem mining weevil biocontrol agent, which is this nice little guy in this picture. Researchers found that within four years of release, 
the biocontrol agents had infested a significant percentage of toad flax stems, and toad flax populations were declining rapidly. However, in 2013, a wildfire ripped through the area and killed the biological control agents while allowing the Dalmatian toad flax population to rebound. In 2014, the researchers went out and re-released the stem mining weevil and continued to monitor the toad flax populations. By 2017, the weevil population had again increased at all release sites and on certain areas within the study area, the toad flax stem mining weevils had infested up to 100% of, of the Dalmatian toad flax stems. The weevils dispersed and population densities were similar at the release and the check sites. And then looking at the vegetation data, Dalmatian toad flax cover declined 99% from 2014 to 2019. And during that same time, annual and perennial grasses increased, annual forbs remained abundant, and perennial forbs and shrubs remained rare. So we need to integrate weed biocontrol into planning wildfire risk mitigation management activities. In the 1996 paper, Biological Control of Weeds and Fire Management in Protected Natural Areas, Are They Compatible Strategies? Brees commented that if one considers both fire management and biological control, as long-term protection strategies, it is necessary to look beyond the case of one fire, one agent, to the interaction of weed biology, agent biology, and the fire regime. If in protected natural areas, fire management and biological control are carried out independently, the latter, biocontrol, is bound to fail. So with that, I'm going to conclude and just recommend that if you want more information about weed biocontrol, please visit ibiocontrol.org or the NASMA biocontrol resource page. And with that, I'll just do a quick land on the references I used in this talk and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Carol. I'm gonna actually pass the mic over to you, Jen, while I fumble around and try to share my screen so I can not have too much uh, jumping around. So, Jen, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Joey. I will first begin by introducing Joey. Joey Milan is the Bureau of Land Management's Biological Control Specialist. Joey did his graduate work at the University of Idaho, where he studied the effects of established biocontrol agents on the invasive brush skeleton weed. At his present post, he serves as the BLM's interagency coordinator for biological control, assisting weed control practitioners in their integrated weed management approach by providing technical assistance and monitoring of past releases, as well as organizing new collections and additional post uh, potential release sites. In addition to these duties, he is the co-chair of NIESMA's Classical Biological Control Committee. My name is Jennifer Andres. I am a professor with Washington State University Extension, where I lead the Integrated Weed Control Project and act as the state weed biocontrol specialist. Before working for WSU, I worked and completed my undergraduate and graduate education with biocontrol research programs in Canada, Switzerland, and Idaho. In 2015, I joined WSU and shifted my focus onto invasive species education, biocontrol imp implementation and education, and I am the primary biocontrol resource for Washington State. In addition to this work, I chair the Flowering Rush Biocontrol Consortium. I'm co-chair of the Columbia Basin CWMA, and I conduct research for several weed biocontrol systems. With that, Joey, I will let you take it away for us. Okay, quick overview. <laughs> as has been discussed previous by Carol and others, um, I'm gonna talk about wildfire and invasive species control. Um, we're gonna dive into some select species. Carol did mention domination toad flax. But primarily thus far, we've been talking about invasive annual grasses. There are some select other species that respond very well to fire, but we're going to go through some of the specifics regarding those species and what they do in response to fire and some potential tools that you might have um, as participants to an active restoration process. And then Carol teed this last part up very nicely, and then that is where should biocontrol put into a post-fire item approach. So as has been discussed so far, we have had some massive wildfires throughout the West. 
in those responses, primarily we do get some burned area rehab or do uh, bear dollars or some ESR, emergency stabilization or rehabilitation dollars. But historically, the funding for those has been limited to three to five years. Whereas some of the problems that we contend with happen on a regional scale and they take a lot longer than three to five years to deal with. So this is where we see biocontrol filling a, a hole and a need with that IPM approach. So first up, I wanted to talk about the leafy spurge. Leafy spurge, spurge or euphorbia frigata, is a deep-rooted perennial. It is aggressive. It does disperse by seed and vegetatively, so it does respond very well to fires. It is difficult to control. Uh, rapidly recolonizes those fires and forms very dense stands as a response to fire. This is also an issue in those coveted riparian zones. Fortunately, there are several biocontrol agents available for leafy spurge control. One of those is the Aphthona species complex. We kind of have them all listed in, in the same there because they have the same basic mode of destruction. Aphthona, which is that pretty beetle in the top right corner of the slide there, is something that needs to be actively managed. We have used these as an inundative approach, kind of like using it as a bioherbicide. In those riparian areas, especially where we have issues with using herbicides because of label uh, restrictions. It can survive fires, surprisingly. There's a bunch of other agents as well. I'll let you kind of go ahead and, and uh, read those. And I, I will point out that we do have an agent that doesn't really get a lot of recognition, and that is Uberia erythrocephala. It is becoming more of a success story as this agent becomes more and more established. It is a very good disperser, and it is the subject of uh, further study, primarily being headed up by Dr. Natalie West with ARS. Dalmatian toe flax, Carol mentioned this one, and this is another great example of that response. This is a slide from Jen. The Neri Dalmatica does recolonize very quickly after a fire as well. We do have a dynamite biocontrol agent, and that is the sinus chanthaniformis. It is very well established, but you can see from one year to the other at that same site, that tunk block fire, that response of Dalmatian toe flax minus the biocontrol agents and that top-down control is pretty intense. Um, another example is the Elmer City fire from 2016. Jen went out and did some study sites, looking at some permanent monitoring transects. Hundreds of acres resurged after that 2016 fire. The Colville tribe was unable to control with other methods, so they did implement biocontrol. Going out and actually doing the monitoring, you see on the y-axis the number of stems and insects, the tallest stem in the height by centimeters, and you can see, you sort of get an oscillation, and what you see over time is the number of insects does decline as the number of stems per quadrant and also the height of the tallest stem declines. So these insects are basically uh, eating themselves out of house and home. And the Dalmatian toe flax populations have been dropping for years, and those sinus pot numbers are crashing. Uh, they're behind it due to a lack of those plants. So this was a really good situation where biocontrol was implemented after a fire, um, with great success, very similar to the one that, that Carol mentioned before. Uh, we also have knapweeds, which are really common to come in uh, after a fire. And this is a knapweed complex. We've got spotted knapweed, meadow knapweed, and diffuse knapweed. And these are all relatively more invasive in certain parts of the U.S. and North America in general. They spread by seed, they increase soil erosion, decrease biodiversity, decrease the quality of forage, and they are, as I mentioned, very quick to respond after a fire. The Napweed biocontrol agents, there are 13 of them. I'm going to talk about some that are more important than others, um, not necessarily giving a lot of time to those that won't really matter much. Lorinus obtusus is that one on the left. Um, it is a seed head eating weevil. It attacks spotted meadow and diffuse napweed. Currently the best agent for meadow napweed, and it does decrease seed production. However, spotted napweed is not a seed limited plant. Lorinus minutus is a close cousin, obviously. It is a seed head feeding weevil as well. It attacks diffuse spotted in the meadow. Strong impact on diffuse in eastern Washington. We've also seen similar results here in Idaho. Adults can defoliate plants, as that picture indicates in that center left or right there. It does decrease seed production as well. And it is important to note that mowing and spraying is not compatible with this agent. And also, and we'll talk about Russian napweed, there is a distinction between Russian napweed and these uh, napweeds in the napweed complex that we mentioned. The last one I'm going to mention for the napweed complex is Cyphothrona cicadis. It is a beautiful weevil. It's fun to work with. It's fun to get kids involved with. It is a root feeding weevil. It attacks spotted and diffuse napweed. It does decrease biomass and density. 
It can kill small plants and we found uh, adults all over the place in August and September. And you can see what it does to those roots in that larval root damage picture that is posted in the middle of the slide. Um, the larvae are, are kind of inconspicuous, but uh, you can dig through them and find their larval tunnels and find them readily. Um, this is not widely available. It's kind of a tough one to collect. Mowing may be compatible with this agent because of when it does emerge. And primarily it's in the stems when you might be mowing this biocontrol agent. Spraying is not compatible. And again, uh, we want to differentiate this from Russian napkin. The few snapweed, Jen had a, a great example of Carlton complex fire in 2014 and that diffuse snapweed um, response to the fire. And here's an indication of what that looks like and what happens over time. And there's some data that goes along with it due to the monitoring that's taken place after these fires have occurred. And the data show a similar situation, although the elongated graphs are, are truncated because there's only four years worth of data. This site in particular is tough for folks to get back to because of the fire danger, hence the fire in the first place. But you do see the insects do mirror the stems per quadrat and the height of the tallest stem. So you kind of see that curve and the lag, and now you see the insects kind of starting to wane at the site since the target weed is also moving off site. Here in Idaho, our export weed that we have is rush skeleton weed. And as Steve mentioned, this is something that we're near and dear to here in Idaho. It does quickly invade after fires. It spreads rapidly because it can reproduce both vegetatively and by seed. And Dr. Tim Prather with the University of Idaho has done some work that looks at the spread of those seeds on wind convection currents and found that it can get 50 miles away. So when I hear people tell me they have a first indication of rush skeleton weed, I, I say that's the first one you found. There's probably going to be many more if you keep looking. And some of those, the reason why rush skeleton weed is so hard to find is because, as its name implies, it's relatively indiscriminate. It is spreading rapidly in lots of different areas. We've got four biocontrol agents established. We've got the, the rust, the midge, and the mite, which are these three over here. Cystophora schmidii, Eriophius condrilliae, and Percinia chondrolina. But the one I'm going to focus is going to be primarily on Brady Rowe and Gilvia Lella because that's the new player on the block. It is difficult to collect. This was released first in 2002 with uh, Montana State University and Jeff Littlefield, and also retired forest researcher George Margan. When we've done collections, we found that sex ratio is an issue. We found way more males than females, which is obviously problematic. It is not well established, although we are finding more sites where it is established seemingly every year. And the emphasis on plant resistance was done after genetic work indicated that some of those other species, the rest of the region might, were so specific, sometimes they were biotype specific and not very impactful on the existing populations that we have of rush skeleton. We've got a number of additional candidate species in the pipeline I'm not going to address. We are also cautiously optimistic about several species to consider, especially after a wildfire, because we start to see pictures like this. And this is again courtesy of uh, Dr. Jeff Littlefield with Montana State. Uh, before and after pictures uh, make, a, make a world of difference, but when you couple that with the actual data that we're seeing on the ground, you can see a dramatic reduction of almost 30 plants per quarter meter squared, all the way down to less than one in a 10-year period of sampling. Sampling has concluded for this site, kind of moved off of this. The stem density with Brady Roa has shown to be very impactful. In addition, one of the commenters in the chat asked this question, what are we getting in response to a successful biocontrol agent? What we're seeing right now is, you can see the blue here is rush skeleton weed. And as that population has just kind of plummeted, um, we're seeing forbs that are kind of rebounding a little bit, Primarily the grass components coming back, but for the most part, there's an empty niche there, and that's bare ground. Um, so this is, again, data from Jeff Littlefield, and we are cautiously optimistic that uh, we might have a very long-term solution to some of our rush skeleton problems. The last example I'm going to talk about is Russian napwe, Conticum repens, or Propylon repens, as it used to be referred to. It is a long-lived perennial. It's toxic, causes chewing disease, and forms dense monocultures like you see from that picture from Steve Dewey down below. Jennifer Andrews is leading the charge with a couple of these biocontrol agents in the Pacific Northwest here. Two agents in particular, Alicidia, which is a, a wasp calling stem um, insect. It's established several sites. We do see rapid population increases, and it is available for mass distribution. You can see the pictures of what it does to Russian napweed there. 
Yap Yella Vanikovi is a doll niche. It creates shoot dolls. It does require sites with continual seasonal growth, usually around our neck of the woods. That means that it has to have its feet wet and continued vegetation growth throughout the year where it doesn't synapse very early. It is available for mass distribution as well. And an important note, mowing and spraying is not compatible with Russian rapid biocontrol. And the flip side of what I said earlier, this is not for diffuse spotted or another napkin. Jen does have some data to go along with some of these pictures that we've seen with rapid colonization. You can see that we have the height of the tallest stem is oscillating back and forth, and the stems for quadrats are pretty stable, but we have early results in with huge increases in population. And we did see a little bit of a dip here, but Jen attributes that to some of the galls for Alicidia are not being counted as distinct galls because they tend, tend to blend together. And the monitoring protocol does say that when they blend together, they might impact those galls because they have to be distinct to be counted. So chances are pretty good that that insect count probably does continue to go up, but we will start to see an effect with this biocontrol agent, uh, primarily Alicidia, going forward. <clears throat> so long-term wildfire impacts. Economic and ecological impact studies are challenging and also very, very rare when it comes to biocontrol. Site restoration and increased forage, wildlife habitat, native species and culturally important plants need to be included in that. Biocontrol needs to be considered as a viable option in an IPM approach when successful biocontrol agents are available. The Coldwell tribe could not have managed what they did without having that biocontrol tool. So to kind of sum things up, IPM and biocontrol, the goal is to know the tool you need for your objective. If eradication is the objective, biocontrol is probably not going to be a good solution for you. It will not eradicate the issue, but when we work with landscape level species that have completely degraded large swaths of, of land throughout regions, pressure or containment is possible with biocontrol. Examine all possible methods, such as mechanical, cultural, and chemical control, and decide which method is best for you. Increase weed, weed awareness and prevention in all fire training and integrate biocontrol where feasible. And with that, I believe we are at a pause for questions. And also, we have a break schedule, but I do see a couple of Q&As in there that I've not been able to attend to. So I'll stop sharing and we'll move back to this platform. And I would encourage uh, both Carol and Michelle to uh, be at the ready for some of those questions if they are um, for that. But did you see one question where someone was asking about, this is Carol, and somebody was asking about involvement of the departments of transportation or departments of agriculture in some of the larger um, invasive plant programs. And the group in forest service that I work for is the state private and tribal forestry group. So we work with the national forest system as well as our state and tribal and private partners as well. And the Forest Service does have a national invasive plant program through the Forest Health Protection Group, where we can provide funding to states to help them with invasive um, plant program set up and, and carried out. And so at least for the regions where I work, which are the Northern and Intermountain regions, um, Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, Utah, Nevada, we do have the ability to talk frequently with state departments of agriculture, and we work very well together. Departments of transportation, it's much more on a state-by-state -state basis, and who's involved with Department of Transportation. If the departments of transportation are engaged with the departments of agriculture, usually there are opportunities to work together, and especially if departments of transportation are engaged with local cooperative weed management areas. So there, there are opportunities to make sure that we're engaging with some of these other state um, partners. And I do see a question in the chat for Michelle. Michelle, I'm curious if you work on wildland fire sagebrush habitat as extended into BC. We seem to be lacking international collaboration and studies. This year and many other years, we have seen large fires across Canada-US border. Would appreciate your thoughts on how we can improve international efforts. I think it should be added to your emerging needs slide. Yes, I will say that we definitely need to be collaborating more um, internationally on addressing some of these issues. And, and I realize, yes, yeah, some a lot of these studies they always do end at the boundary level, and uh, 
a lot of that is just because of data. Um, and, and so I think there needs to be more of an effort of being able to share a lot of data, especially the spatial data. I know I use a lot to conduct a lot of these different analyses and research. So I would say to Lisa, if your data is available, it would be great to be able to expand some of the analyses uh, that I've done into Canada, for sure. And I know exactly of that area that you're talking about right over the border um, with the sagebrush lands that are in Canada. And so I'd be really curious to hear what you were seeing and, and more of your experiences there. Thank you, Michelle, and I'll read this for the panel. The problem I see with this increased treatment of forested or really areas is there is minimal to no support from fire fuels programs to provide funding to the same office, not just the programs. Washington office needs to identify a funding program element to show that fuels funding should and need to be used in areas where forest improvements have been done. Otherwise, if we have all this on the ground work done and no funding to follow up with IPM treatments, it seems as if we may just be going in circles. Yeah, I'm not sure if Steve is on and available, but we've talked about this as an issue within the federal family. Michelle and Steve probably are more equipped to answer that than I. Um, I will add to that, and I will say that, you know, for BLM, we have been uh, making an effort to do more invasive plant treatments and using our fuels management funding. And so while that is growing, I, I think for a while, those pots were very separate. And essentially, that is what our NISC WIFLIC interagency task team identified was the need for those two programs to be much more integrated together. And when there is a project that's coming up, whether that be thinning, use of prescribed fire, any of those types of fuel treatments, fuel breaks, to be able to coordinate and work together and being able to control invasive plants in those areas, either eradicating, controlling or that early detection rapid response. I'll just add to that in that the fuels program has been very supportive in combating noxious weeds. I think the question goes back to maybe what I mentioned in my talk is that there's just a level of unawareness between lots of different people on that. So I think that's one of the things getting our fuels folks more in tuned in the possibilities biocontrol, I think would go a long way towards that. Yeah, and I would agree completely with Steve. I think there's a lot of information, education, and outreach that is needed to bring the two programs even closer together so they can further understand what some of these treatments might be achieving one goal, but potentially causing an issue um, in trying to obtain a goal for field treatments. So I'll just jump in as well. We're coming off of the Western Weed Coordinating Committee meeting last week where that group, which is just basically all the Western state departments of ag, the weed program managers, they're getting ready to rewrite the Western Weed Action Plan. And that's one of the topics that they have identified in funding is the need to make sure that we're communicating across the federal families, you know, the need to make sure that we do have dedicated line item funding to address weed problems. So I know that it's something that our state private and tribal partners are definitely identifying. I know that NISC is engaged with this. I know that the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition is engaged with it. So I think we're getting there, but yeah, we definitely still have some work to do. There is a question in the chat, and Jenna, I'm going to key you up for this one. For Russian Napoli Biological Control in the Great Basin, is there any evidence of uh, Alicidia uh, or Yapiella being more successful than the other? Are there scent characteristics that would help with the decision between the two? Well, it's a little challenging for me to talk about specifically the Great Basin because I'm here in Washington, but I can um, tell you that on the whole, uh, what we're seeing um, in most states where we're implementing Russian Napoli biocontrol is that Alicidia is the superior biocontrol agent. And that appears to be related to its ability to establish at a lot of different sites. Um, Yapiella, so the gall midge requires the plants to continually throughout the growing season produce new shoots. So that usually means the site has to be a little bit wetter. And so we don't see Yapiella necessarily building to large controlling populations unless the site's quite wet 
or if it's being grazed or mowed because that stimulates growth in the Russian knapweed. So even though we see Yapiella pretty much consistently at every site we release it, it's really just in those areas where there's a little more moisture. Whereas Alicidia um, is laying its eggs in the spring and it is um, really able to establish in, in much drier environments. And so I think that both are damaging, uh, but Alicidia is doing some really phenomenal damage out there. So I think that's the one to really focus on if you have to choose between the two. It's also perhaps a little bit easier to get Alicidia adults than it is to get Yapiella adults because they're a little less hardy. And if you move galls around, you do risk moving parasitoids as well. And so you, you don't want to move um, your galls around because you could introduce a parasitoid into the site. So instead, uh, we're moving adults and Alicidia adults are just a little bit more robust. That's probably too much information. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate that. There's, there's more information than I wanted to say. <laughs> Carol, your hands up. Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, I don't know if um, Andrea Moe and Amber Mendenhall are on the call, but they are biocontrol coordinators for Nevada and Utah, and, and they're seeing very similar things. Um, they do have populations of both Yapiel and Alucidia, but Alucidia is by far and away the one that's more readily established and easier to deal with. But they do have both. Okay, not seeing any more questions rather than the Q&A. And I would, again, encourage folks to, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A and not the chat room. Okay, as we come out of break, Jody gave a great reminder that we do have the first national forum for biological control that will be happening in Annapolis, Maryland. From March 11th to March 14th, Mason is helping to get the word out for that, and they are a uh, participating member as well. This is funded by the Forest Service with help from some other folks. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. Charlene Singh. She is a research entomologist based at the Bozeman Forestry Services Laboratory, USDA Forest Service, Rocky Mountain Research Station. Her research focuses on developing, evaluating, optimizing, and increasing the use of classical biological control of weeds. Her primary targets include invasive toad flaxes, Russian olive, and salt cedar. This work is influenced by an overarching interest in ecological risk assessment. She also serves as the chair of the Technical Advisory Group for Biological Control of Weeds. And Charlene, you look good, and we can hear you before, so hopefully that's still the case. Take it away. Okay. So thanks for the invitation to present today in uh, the Biocontrol Summit. There, um, my presentation is different than the previous ones because it's not an overview of a topic, but it is um, basically meant to serve as a case study in how biocontrol can mitigate wildfire impacts associated with salvation of toad flats. So today I'm going to summarize the results from a long-term, and that's a 10-year study where we looked at uh, Dalmatian biocontrol. Um, and the study is located at, in the Helena Hazel Park National Forest, west of Raider Creek, Montana, in the Elkhorn Mountains. Forest Service land managers were open to posting a study to compare conventional chemical control versus biocontrol after this area had become heavily infested with Dalmatian toad flax following wildfire. The yellow arrow on this map points to the PPI study location, and that's the name that we gave this particular um, project. For reference, the study, the city of Helena is north, east is southwest, and three ports is south. Weed management strategies, which included biocontrol, herbicide, and no treatment options, were assessed separately on three 300-acre treatment areas. The no treatment option was included as it is a standard feature of land management planning. The study was intentionally set up so that we could evaluate and compare weed treatment efficacy under typical operational conditions. Locating the study within an active national forest grazing allotment was therefore intentional. So this is what the Heli Spring area looked like at the beginning of the study in 2013, before the herbicide treatment was applied. The area was then was bunch grass dominated and infested with dense, well-defined patches of Dalmatian toad flax. The biocontrol treatment area looked like this in 2013. 
a nice mix of grasses, forbs, and shrubs with extensive and advanced salvation toad flax infestation. In contrast, the control area looked like this in 2013. Toad flax covered there which was sparse and intermittent for the duration of the study. And I just would like to note that it was a control in that we didn't release biocontrols or um, spray it, but it also was sort of a litmus test on how well biocontrol was working to keep Dalmatian toad flax from spreading into purely uninfested areas. Data were recorded from 10 permanently marked 20 meter transects established in each of the three treatment areas. So we had a, a total of 30 transects. This map shows the locations of the three treatment areas and their associated transects. So the purpose of the study was to evaluate and compare the long term impacts of biocontrol herbicide with no treatment option on target and non target plant species in the Elkhorn uh, Cooperative Wildlife Management Area. Unfortunately, I don't see non-target plant species data analyzed yet. So today I'm going to limit my comments to impacts on the weed targeted for management and that was obviously Dalmatian toad flax. For those who don't know um, about toad flax or Dalmatian toad flax, it's native to eastern, the eastern Mediterranean area. It was first anecdotally recorded in the U.S. as an intentionally introduced horticultural specimen in Massachusetts in the mid-1800s. Dalmatian toad flax is a short-lived perennial with reproductive stems arising from overwintering rosettes. A mature plant can generate half a million seeds annually, with some remaining viable in the seed bank up to 10 years. It also propagates vegetatively for root buds. This is an obligate toad flax. So, in general, it needs to be pollinated by insects. The herbicide assessment study with picogram, which was applied at a rate of 1.5 points per acre on July 14, 2013. Inspections two weeks later indicated that the treatment was effective, and that's the picture on the lower right. The biocontrol agent used in the study was the Dalmatian toad flax thin mining weevil. On the left, the larval stage of the agent, and on the right, an adult weevil. Larval feeding within the stems interferes with the transportation of plant nutrients and moisture. The adults attack the foliage and flower buds, reducing the flowering and inhibiting photosynthesis, which we believe is the reason why plants eventually die from attack. The weevils used in this study were procured through a commercial provider. I know that's not always the use of the but for our purposes, it was necessary because we wanted to do high density inundated releases to minimize the lag time between release establishment and impact. Helena National Forest uh, personnel estimate that Nicholas Champion Formist adults were released at an approximate rate of 640 per acre, which sounds very high, but we wanted to do an inundated release, so that's why we did it. They were re released. Between late May and early June 2014. Transect data for the study were recorded according to the SIMP monitoring protocol between 2013 and 2023. So this was a 10 year study. In this talk, I refer to frames. When I refer to frames, those would be the 10 Dalton Meyer flat racks placed at two marked intervals along each 20 meter monitoring channel. And here you can see um, people collecting field data. This plot shows on the y axis mean frames with Dalmatian toad flax present annually for each of the three treatments, with control counts reported in pink, toy spray in purple, and biocontrol in blue. As you can see here, there is no appreciable difference in toad flax infestation in the heli spray in biocontrol transects at the beginning of the study. In 2014, the first year after the helicopter applied Hippogram treatment, the number of heli spray frames with Dalmatian toad flax present, here in purple, dropped dramatically before increasing annually between 2015 
in my opinion. Mean annual toad flats infestation in the biocontrol transepts here in the blue line remain comparatively consistent until 2021. The Dalmatian toad flats infestation in the control transects followed a trajectory similar to what we reported in the biocontrol transepts. No major changes until we observed a decrease in 2021, which is held steady through 2022. This plot shows the mean annual number of mature or reproductive Dalmatian toad flat stems for each of the three treatments using the same color scheme. Mature toad flat stem counts were again similar at the beginning of the study for the in the heli spray and um, biocontrol transfer. The herbicide application in 2013 resulted in a major reduction in mature stems as we saw in the previous series of graphs in the heli spray uh, transects in 2013. Mass releases in the Phoenix Gentlemen's were not made until 2014, so we were not surprised by the increase in the number of mature Dalmatian toad flat stems between 2013 and 2014, or by the consistent reductions observed beginning in 2015. Mean number of mature stems in all three treatment areas began to converge in 2017 and remain similar throughout the 2021 field season. In 2023, we observed a significant increase in Dalmatian toad flats in the heli spray transfer. So we had really good suppression up to a point, and then now it's beginning to go upward. In 2019, we began collecting 20 stem samples of Dalmatian tongue flax in the vicinity within 50 meters by outside of each of the 30 monitoring transects to assess the spread and abundance of Messina's Jansenoformis in all three treatment areas. Weevil abundance was similar across treatment areas in 2019. Weevils per millimeter of stem samples increased noticeably in the control transects in 2021 and remained similarly high through 2023. In 2023, I was relieved to find that weevil abundance in the biocontrol stems had also finally increased. So in summary, we found that 10 years after aerial application of PICORAM, the total number of Dalmatian reproductive and immature stems was highest in the heli spray treatment area. In contrast, total stems in the biocontrol treatment area have declined significantly following the release of Messina's Jansenoformis in 2014. The biocontrol agent has spread unassisted throughout the entire study site, suppressing Dalmatian toad flax infestations in all three treatment areas. These results indicate to me that biocontrol can be a sustainable long term management option for the Dalmatian toad flax, including in fire affected areas. So with that, I'd like to give my sincere thanks to all who have provided um, technical support on this project over the years. And I am extremely grateful to the Hill and National Forest for believing in the value of this type of research. Um, and my thanks to all of the funding sources that provided support over the last 10 years. And if there's any time left, I'd be happy to answer questions or if people would like to email me, please go ahead. Thank you, Charlene. Um, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next presenter, but we do have a period of time at the end of uh, the presentations for uh, live Q&A. Or if you have additional questions, please put those in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Melissa Smith is a research ecologist for the USDA's Invasive Plant Research Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Melissa joined the lab in 2012 and focuses on broad ecological interactions of large-scale plant invasions and their introduced biological control agents have with the native community. Some of the species Melissa is currently investigating include Malaluca quinquinervia, quin uh, Acacia aripelliformis, Ligodium microphyllum, and uh, Pontideria. At the Invasive Plant Research Laboratory, Dr. Smith has delved into many collaborative projects to investigate 
larger ecological questions like competition, predation, parasitism, succession um, within a biological control context. So with that, Melissa, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Joey. Uh, we're gonna move a little bit further south where it's actually not snowing. We have 80 degrees and a totally different system than you might think would be involved with fire and biological control. So let's get right to it. So if you head down to peninsular South Florida, south of Lake Okeechobee, you're going to find the River of Grass, which is the rather poetic name that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas gave to this ecosystem, which is dominated by slow flowing laminar water from Lake Okeechobee South into Florida Bay. And while much of this ecosystem is made out of sawgrass marshes, composed of uh, graminoids, but also forbs, rushes, lots of other species. Once you get down into limestone, which is right underneath the marl and sort of like nutrient deficient soils, that's when we get into these beautiful cypress stones and pond apple sloughs. So this is where you'll find alligators, lots of orchid species, including the ghost orchid. Water tends to be fairly deep here. And if we go up in elevation a bit, we'll get into tree islands and tropical hardwood hammocks that are dominated by palms, which you can see here in the foreground, but also tropical species of hardwoods like mahoganies. And then finally, as we come out of the swamp, we get into the pine flatwoods, which are dominated by Pinus eliotii or slash pine. And this is all part of this ridge slough topography, which interplays with our water system in that water flows through the sloughs, gets stopped up by sawgrass ridges, which builds sediment. And then as that sediment build, then tree islands can uh, establish on them. And as we go up in topography, and by up, I do mean mere centimeters, that's when we get into our slash pine forests. And Something that you might not know, though, about South Florida is that we are the lightning strike capital of the United States. So more people die from lightning strikes in Florida than elsewhere. Interestingly, most of those are around Orlando, but we have many of them in South Florida, and that creates a system wherein fire is a normal, regular part of our dynamics. So it's natural. In all likelihood, the indigenous folks that lived here before uh, contact utilized it, and we still utilize it today for management and maintaining that uh, ecosystem, especially through the slash pine and the sawgrass marshes. Fire is very infrequent in the cypress stones, but does hit there occasionally. But most fires that occur naturally are low intensity and low elevation. They stay in the understory of these. So how do invasive species impact these systems? Well, in the Everglades and much like elsewhere in our uh, affected ecosystems, we see that invasive species impact fire cycles primarily through an increase in biomass that increases both severity and frequency. In addition, they alter that carbon and nitrogen cycle. So you have more carbon to be released from soils and that can provide a positive feedback mechanism that favors invasive species. They can increase soil temperature, again, providing a positive feedback loop wherein invasive species seeds will germinate over native species seeds. And then like the picture shown in left, species like Ligodium microfilum or old world climbing fern climb into the canopy and take what would have been a low intensity understory fire way up into the canopy, increasing severity and impact. Just to include other impacts, we've seen all of the fire and invasive species impacts are further exacerbated by changes in the hydrology. The Everglades, in addition to being a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is also one of the highest impacted ecosystems in terms of hydrology. We've been dredging and moving water away from the historic Everglades for the last hundred years. So now what flows into the Everglades is about 40% of what should be there historically. That, of course, impacts the fire water drought cycle. And 
simply because of the bias of introduction, we had more people introducing more species from these areas in Australia. These species are coincidentally fire tolerant, and that includes the species that I made Joey pronounce, but Leluca, Casuarina, Early Ficacia, and Old World Climbing Fern. So I'll talk about Leluca and Old World Climbing Fern, and then I'll hit on Brazilian pepper, which is impacted negatively by fire, but also has an interesting recovery mechanism. So let's talk about the avian complex fire in Big Cypress uh, that happened in 2018. This was uh, more than 100,000 acres were involved, and this is the map. So that uh, 75 is Alligator Alley that goes east to west across South Florida, and it burned through sawgrass, cypress, pine, and oak-dominated communities. So notice cypress there and pine. And then it was followed by summer rains. So that cypress to pine ecotone is really important in this equation because that's where Melaleuca likes to grow. This was also the site of extensive Melaleuca invasions throughout the 2000s, but we worked very hard with integrated management and our partners to get what was a 440,000 acre invasion by Melaleuca throughout the Everglades ecosystem down 90 plus percent. So when this fire came through, this is the system that you would have seen. So interspersed pines going up to a very large cypress domes in an intact community with sparse adult melaleuca trees throughout. But when we went into the system after this fire, much like what other folks have shown in terms of post-fire pictures and their invasive species coming in with huge germination events, we see a carpet of melaleuca seedlings. And both the public and land managers have an absolute apoplexy in response to this. So Melaleuca is from Northern Australia. It is fire tolerant. As an adult, it has essential oils within the bark that will act as an accelerant. And then it also has serotonous seed capsules that uh, produce millions of tiny seeds that will then uh, disperse aerially on those fire induced winds. We have three established Melaleuca biological control agents, one of the most important being the weevil Oxyops vidiosa, but also a psyllid Boreoglycaspis melaleuci, which is the insect on the far right, and then two galling midges, one of which just was released this year, and the other which was released in 2010. So both of those produce pretty impressive galls on the seedlings and fully grown trees. In uh, 2017, Phil Tipping published a nice paper with his colleagues looking at a post-fire response in Picayune Forest, which is just west of Big Cypress National Preserve. And they found that mortality in five years with two of those insects, the psyllid and the weevil, was at about 65 to 70%, give or take, post-fire when biological control was present. It was only 28% when biological control was controlled. If we go to height, individuals that were attacked by biological control were about one quarter of the size of those who were not attacked by biological control. And then uh, in addition, the post-fire damage rating was also higher on controlled versus uncontrolled. I went back into Big Cypress to look at the interactions of biological control with herbicide after that avian complex fire and found similar rates of mortality, if we look at the far right column, at two years post-fire. So the addition of another insect, that galling midge, allowed us to have a higher rate of seedling mortality at a, a sooner time point. So for us, that's quite appealing, right? Two to three years post-fire, we're seeing mortality rates at the same rate that we were at five years with one fewer insect. But if you're looking at this from a management perspective, 70% mortality is still probably too low for them to tolerate. Now, if we let this go further and longer, we would probably have seen a higher mortality rate, but these sites eventually were treated and no surprise, herbicide works 
but uh, biological control is also quite effective post-fire in this system. So we're really hoping um, and appreciative that we were involved with the post-fire uh, investigations and are hoping that uh, continues for other events. We did notice that, you know, water matters in these systems and wet sites had lower rates of mortality than dry sites. And that is likely driven by the fact that that Oxyops video, so the Melaleuca weevil can't pupate in wet soils. So its impact is lessened when seedlings are in wet soils. So if we were going to say focus anywhere with treatments, we would say focus on the wet areas with treatments. Again, that new insect, that new midge may be more helpful in these areas because it does not require soil to pupate, but it remains to be seen. The next species I'll talk about is Ligodium microfilum or old world climbing fern, which is a Vining climbing fern, very weird. It has indeterminate growth within its rachis, so it acts like a vine even though it is a fern. Very old lineage. And we have a couple of different biological control agents out on it, but one of them is this Areophyid mite, a face only a mother could love. It is a leaf galling mite, but it also attacks apical meristems. So the top picture is a healthy apical meristem of this growing fern. And if you look at the bottom one, that is what they do when they gall it. So it, it absolutely smashes the ability of this species to climb. In 2020, Aaron David and Ellen Lake looked at post-fire growth of the rachis when it was attacked by the mites. And what they found was regardless of the season and regardless of whether it was grown in sun or shade, that rachises that were attacked by mites didn't really recover. You can see that the growth rate here is between zero and 0.5 centimeters per day when they're attacked by the mites. Now these mites are free floating in the atmosphere. They are essentially aerial plankton, and so they are readily available uh, to recolonize these. So this is another good example of how these biocontrol agents can integrate with fire as a management technique. And the last example I'll talk about is Brazilian pepper tree. Unlike the other two systems, it's fire intolerant. So Stevens showed that fire kills small plants and reduces the fecundity of larger plants because it basically just takes off the entire top of the plant. However, as plants get larger in diameter, they're able to recover. So at about two centimeters in diameter, maybe even more so to, depending on the severity of the fire, all of the individuals will die, but these larger individuals are able to survive. And then those are able to re-sprout and build up their biomass once again through underground resources. But a recent release of this pseudophilothrips ichini, so Brazilian pepper thrips, is going to be integrated with these physical management techniques, including fire and including grinding. So these thrips, again, very small charismatic organism, like to attack the growing tips of Brazilian pepper tree. So we have found that uh, trimming will often flush a new growth and then the thrips will attack that growth. And then we're hoping that the same thing happens both post herbicide, post grinding, and also post fire. So stay tuned for more information from that. That's uh, data that's coming out of Dale Halbritter and uh, Greg Wheeler's labs here in Florida. So just to wrap it up, biological control and fire in the Everglades work together at, at the pre-fire stage to reduce biomass and reduce the severity of fires in these ecosystems, bringing it back from the canopy down into that low-grade fire, and also reducing the fecundity of the targets of our biocontrol. In the post-fire phase, uh, they reduce survivorship, they reduce climbing, and they reduce reproduction. And then increasingly, and what several of the speakers today have said, is that biocontrol in this system is compatible with several other methods. And so they are compatible with integrated management to have longer, more sustainable effects. And that is 
all part of that idea that biological control is a long-term sustainable self-sustaining population that adds value over time and that's particularly important when you're working with the largest ecosystem restoration project in the United States and potentially the world with the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Biological control is part of that. We are the first fully operational part of the CERP program and our impact on invasive plants is critical to rebuilding and maintaining that important hydrological resource um, and water and nutrients getting into the Everglades. I will have a look at the question and answer session, but my email is there and I'm always happy to engage and answer questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melissa. I don't see anything in the Q&A right now, but um, we do have plenty of time for that and for folks to digest your talk. And that's as close to Florida as I personally want to get. So I appreciate the, the presentation. Lastly, bringing up the rear end here, we've got Dr. Tom Dudley, who is an aquatic ecologist working in Western rivers and riparian systems with the Marine Science Institute at UC Santa Barbara, with graduate degrees in aquatic entomology from Oregon State University and UCSB, and postdoc studies in desert ecosystems through Arizona State University. His rivers kept getting infested by non-native plants, so he has evolved to studying the impacts and control of invasive plants and animals, particularly the use of biocontrol as part of riparian restoration programs. Well, thanks a lot. Nice to be bringing this up. I guess that means I can keep going at the end rather than stopping my time limit. Um, no, not really. Um, okay, so this is talking about another type of a system, but dealing with, uh, again, like the last talk, woody invasive plants that, um, as you know, take several years to really have an impact from biocontrol. But um, in particular, Tamarisk is a situation where we have a major factor of the of its role in promoting wildfire. And as has been talked about, there are a lot of invasive plants that are associated with promoting wildfires. And in particular, in riparian areas, we have quite a number of those. But I'm going to focus on Tamarisk here. And it's a program we've been involved in for over 20 years now. So... Tamarisk is pretty widespread. It's basically composed of several different species. Uh, a hybrid between Tamarisk ramosissima and Tamarisk chinensis is the primary form across the western U.S. It forms rather dominant stands in a lot of our riparian systems in the southwestern states. And as the, the map shows, it has capacity for distribution even further. That's a suitability map. So it, it is continuing to increase increase in a lot of areas. Uh, some of the impacts of Tamarisk is that it, it's uh, dense shading uh, tends to outcompete native vegetation, um, suppresses germination too, and that's particularly promoted by the fact that it pulls up salts from deeper in the soils and deposits them on the soil surface, making germination of native plants difficult. But it also is a very high water user itself, which has been one of the major reasons for its control for several decades. It's associated with changes in the geomorphology of rivers, terrible habitat for wildlife, and it is a wildfire hazard. And it's a wildfire risk whether it's green or whether it's in, in its uh, senescent stage later in the season. And characteristically, it'll burn commonly, but then within weeks, you'll have new growth as shown on the right there. So it comes back from stored carbohydrates in the roots of the plant, as I'll get into a little bit later. And the reason for it being flammable, and particularly compared to native plants, is that it has a more dissected foliage uh, form, meaning that it can dry out much faster than native willows and cottonwoods, which is often replaced. And that means that the time to ignition can be much faster than with the native uh, vegetation. It's associated with actually turning a riparian areas from being barriers to fire movement into, as Carl mentioned earlier, wicks for moving fire between different zones and through the riparian zone itself. 
So our graduate student, Gail Drews, did a survey across the southwestern state of all areas where she knew of uh, or could find records of fires in riparian areas and wanted to look at the role of tamarisk in um, those fires. And all the red dots are the locations of her study sites. So <clears throat> what she found was that in general, if there was tamarisk present, and shown on the left here, there is tamarisk present, it was more commonly associated with the presence of fire in riparian areas than when tamarisk was absent. But in particular, this is a real interesting one in that what it shows is whether the fires stopped at the riparian edge or whether they continued through the riparian area. And as indicated here, when tamarisk was absent, the native vegetation tended to stop the movement of fires from the adjacent uplands. But if, if uh, tamarisk present, it carried the fire right through those riparian zones. Riparian fires consequently has increased over the years along with tamarisk invasion. And these are old data showing that the increase in fires in the West in general. And the numbers are higher than this. We just don't have the data for this. Um, <clears throat> so going back to um, the relationship between the tamarisk and the native vegetation, what this graph shows is the increase in tamarisk cover and um, whether the native plant materials were killed. In other words, whether, whether there was fine material of the trees still present or whether it was absent. What it shows is as tamarisk increased, the fire um, was much greater in intensity and tended to uh, remove all of the, the finer fuel material from the plant. And this other slide shows basically this is the probability of mortality of cottonwoods in this slide, of willows in this slide, and tamarisk itself as tamarisk increases. So essentially what you've got is a positive feedback loop where tamarisk comes back after fires at a higher abundance than it was previously. So it leads eventually to basically monocultures. And that was sort of the case in this from the San Pedro River in Arizona and shows that the cottonwoods here were killed by fire. So there have been a lot of efforts over many decades to get rid of tamarisk for all these reasons, but they all are fairly expensive and they cause a lot of damage themselves. And as this slide shows and other people have made reference to, the scale of a lot of these invasive plants is such that it's basically too, too much for conventional methods. So several years ago, a group led by Jack Deloach with USDA ARS in Texas initiated a classical biocontrol program for tamarisks, and it was a, a excellent candidate for biocontrol development because there's nothing related to it in North America. It has no negative impacts, low economic value, and we expected there to be a lot of specialist insects just because of the weirdness of the chemistry. And in, indeed, there seemed to be a lot of insects that were associated with tamarisk in the old world where it's native. Um, and of all the ones that appear to be specialists, we've got approval through the tag process for these three agents, a weevil, a, a mealybug, and this is the one we focused on, a chrysomelid beetle, diarabda crinulata, which um, actually is a, a group of species uh, in the diarabda complex. But it was easier to handle, and it had uh, well-known impacts from uh, studies prior to being brought into North America. So both the larvae and the adults feed exclusively on tamarisk, and then it can go through a couple, two to three generations in a year, but then overwinters as adults in the litter below plants. But the nice thing about its feeding is that the insects scrape the tissue so that they ingest some of the tamarisk material, but in the process of scraping, cause water loss, and so it can have a much greater impact just from desiccation of the foliage. But that desiccated material does stay on the plants. Um, and because they can reach high densities, it can have a very quick impact. And then you can see here, these brown plants are ones that have been defoliated at sites in Nevada. This just shows again that the impact can be quite quick. This is a less than a month that can go from a fully green plant to 
totally defoliated, but with the litter foliage still on it. And tamarisk does return, it regrows quite well from initial um, defoliation. And what this slide shows here is that from the first defoliation, it's about three years before we start seeing mortality of the plants. And so it's, it's not a, a rapid process of actual mortality, but nonetheless, what the reason for seeing this gradual mortality is that this shows after a series of defoliation events over multiple years, you have a decline in the stored carbohydrates in the plant. And those are essentially reserves that it needs for regrowing after defoliation or after overwintering. And this is a starch and, and sugars that are stored in the stems of the plants. You can see this effect within a year that as you have an increase in defoliation of the plant, you also have a decrease in the stored carbohydrates in the stems of the plants. And that can be seen as having an effect on mortality of the plants because this is when in Nevada we did controlled burns of areas that had been defoliated already uh, by the diarabda beetles. In the summer, when the plant is using a lot of those carbohydrates, um, you have a higher mortality uh, or when it's used it up, so they're depleted. They have higher mortality than in the fall when it's stored more of those carbohydrates and is able to recover more readily. Uh, this The final uh, one there just shows that with defoliation only, but without fire. So it, uh, there is mortality of the plants just from uh, defoliation by the herbivore alone. But this suggests that actually you can use fire in combination with a period of time of a few years of defoliation as a treatment to enhance the effect of biocontrol. Our beetles had continued to spread quite a long ways across most of the Western US now. And this shows that they've even made it across the border into Mexico as a couple of years ago. And we're working with some cooperators in Mexico now on looking at those effects. But looking at those plants, you say, well, <laughs> they're still, <laughs> they look like a big fire hazard. And indeed they are still a fire hazard, but the question is whether it's worse than it was before. Gail Drews again did some experimental burns both in central Nevada where plants were defoliated by the beetles and in southern Nevada, this is the Lake Mead uh, recreation area where we used herbicides to simulate the defoliation effect of the beetles and then did instrumented burns just to look at fire intensity and fire behavior of plants that have been affected by the beetles. What this shows is with the uh, uh, natural herbivore defoliation, you had a slight increase in areas where the herbivory was um, greater than in a, a nearby areas where there was a lower impact of the beetles. So there was a significant increase in uh, this is the number of minutes above a certain temperature as an index of fire intensity. And the same with the simulated fire Lake Mead, you had a slight increase of the flammability and intensity when the herbicide treatment was applied. But the takeaway message is the differences are very slight. So it's basically the whether plants are green and live or whether they've been desiccated it really doesn't change the flammability that much. But the big difference is in the biomass involved. So what this shows is the flame lengths of plants uh, where the prescribed burns were done in Lake Mead, where there was an order of magnitude more biomass of tamarisk than at the Humble River Central Nevada site. So more material means greater fire intensity. And in other words, fire intensity is driven by biomass, not by the foliage conditions. So what we want to do is reduce that biomass. And that is precisely what the beetle herbivory does, is it causes a, a reduction in the regrowth of the plants the following year because of a, an incremental dieback of the branches as more and more of those stored carbohydrate reserves are depleted. And you can see this in the growth rings too, <clears throat> where these are the annual growth rings 
in a, an area where the Beatles have been active and um, modeling what it would have been if the Beatles had not affected it based on nearby areas that had not been uh, beetle damaged. So biocontrol does clearly reduce the growth and biomass of tamarisk. And therefore, reducing the biomass does lead to a lower fire intensity, and it can enhance the uh, uh, survival of the native trees, essentially moving this curve back in this direction so that you can retain more of that native uh, vegetation in the system and thereby um, enhance the ability to resist future fires as well. So that's uh, the end of my talk there. And... We'll do a stop share. Thank you, Tom. Are there any questions? I'd be glad to answer, or if we go into the discussion section, however you'd like to do that. Well, we will first put Charlene, Melissa, and um, you, Tom, in the firing squad, since you guys haven't had to do it yet, <laughs> to see if there's any questions. I don't see any Q&A um, or anything uh, online thus far. If anybody has anything for the last three presenters, please speak now. Otherwise, we can always open it up as well. I, I should also note that uh, Joey was involved in this program early on, too. It played a really important role in our initial years of the Tamaris program, biocontrol program, getting going. So thanks for that, Joey. Well, you didn't have to mention that, Tom. <laughs> Not seeing anybody pop up. Carla's got a hand up, so we'll go to Carla. I had a, a question for Melissa. I wasn't quite clear because there was a lot of new information in your talk <laughs> about the vines. Like how do you yeah. guys control the vines that uh, are acting as ladder fuel? Do you have like multiple kinds of vines? Um, Ligonia microfilum is probably the worst. You might also be thinking of air potato, which is more of yeah. an urban invader. It's not as problematic in that bigger Everglades ecosystem. It's really more of a sort of urban wildland interface and it senesces in the winter. So you don't get quite as much, but that one too, the biocontrol has been extremely effective. So Liliaceris chennai and now Liliaceris agena are both really, I don't even know that Liliaceris agena has been out long enough to evaluate if it's doing anything, but the first one, Liliaceris chennai just whomped it. So it's not really problematic in that whole fire system, but old world climbing fern absolutely is. And with that one in particular, the biggest issue is really shortening the ability of that rachis to climb and the biggest thing that we're battling now with that system is that mite is very effective on the genotype of the fern that it can gall but like many areified mites it is hyper specific so it prefers one genotype and for a really long time we thought that we had only one genotype of old world climbing fern in Florida, but recent analyses, which are just about to be published, they're in their final revisions, show that we have two. So one is from Northern Queensland, which is our, where our mite is from, but the other is from Thailand. And so the plan now is to go to Thailand, collect that mite, which is ubiquitous, it's all over the range, and then try to get better coverage. So the places, especially on the west coast of Florida, where that plant is really problematic and where there is fire we can get better control on that but but where it's hitting is certainly in that apical meristem and getting it out of the canopy and into the understory the vines are the vines are hard <laughs> yeah thank you for that and then just yeah. a quick question about the agents that you have on the um, brazilian pepper which I have dealt with that plant in Hawaii, and it's just a hor horrible plant. Yes, and it is. So are you saying that the agent is really only effective if the plant is cut so that there's a lot of new apical meristems? It hasn't been out long enough in Florida to really gauge efficacy, but we find highest densities on that new growing material, which is not dissimilar from lots of other agents. Lots of agents prefer the new growing material, right? And, and if mm -hmm. you're thinking about it from a plant growth and energy balance perspective, I mean, that's where the plant is putting most of its resources is in that apical meristem. So much like the mite, if the plant is pouring energy into those growth places and the agent's are attacking those growth places, then that's a huge sink of energy for the plant that it won't be able to um, put out otherwise. I'll caveat that though with 
it is being tested in Hawaii. We tested Rusan Wasses and the Hawaiian species as part of our host range testing to really be able to hand that host range test over to the Hawaiians to be able to, you know, release this, but they have their own permitting system. So I really hope that it it gets released in Hawaii soon too. Very optimistic. You bet. And I don't envy your work with mites either, Melissa. That's not a fun one. I close my eyes and still see mites in microscopes. There, there was a question in the chat. These talks have included a good discussion on interactions of biocontrol with fire. But has there been much research how on how climate change will impact the efficacy of biocontrols and how to adjust tactics for that? And I'll kind of open it up to the whole panel for that one. It looks like Carol already took a stab at it online. Yeah, I mean, there was already a webinar that covered the topic back from um, September 2023. I think Jen was involved with that one, um, reviewing the impacts of climate change on biocontrol agents, identifying research priorities and knowledge gaps back from September of 2023. You can access it through the NASMO website. I will... Thanks for that, Carol. Any other questions for the group? We're all looking at it at both the pre-release and post-release. And it's interesting because the host plant and the agents don't necessarily respond in tandem with each other. And then there's chemistry issues and all sorts of other things that happen with not just a warming climate, but changes in precipitation and what, you know, just general weather events. So it's um it's a big juggernaut of a question, but we are looking at it. Well, I think that might be a wrap. We've left this uh, open-ended for any other discussions that uh, could permeate from the presentations from the day. We'll give everybody, I've heard 18 seconds is how long you need to spend in an uncomfortable silence to elicit response. So we'll do that. And if there are any, then uh, I will turn it over to Jen to close this uh, virtual seminar. Joey, I just wanted to mention that some people did put questions in the chat. So there are also some answers in the chat. Okay. I'm not sure if we want to revisit some of those. Um, oh, yeah. Look at me not not manning the chat and just looking at the uh, Q&A. <laughs> Maybe while you're reading, Joey, I'll just mention that as part of that webinar, Annette Evans, and I'm sorry, Annette, I feel like I'm not really clear on exactly where you're working these days. Um, you maybe can put it in the chat, but Annette Evans has taken the lead on that climate change and biocontrol work. And um, I think that they do plan to have a paper out soon. So stay tuned for that. Joey, do you know if the chat or the question at Q&A are going to be saved somehow with the recording? I think, I'm not sure. That's a question for the NASMA folks. And if either Jody or Christy are on, they can answer that or anybody else. <clears throat> yes, we will be saving the Q&A along with the recording. Okay, and there is a question in the chat. It's a general question about how different states permitting procedures are, uh, work. That's more of a general question than I guess we could tackle here, but also this is a great opportunity to plug the Biocontrol 101 course within NASMA. Um, we do discuss those issues in that 101 course that's available um, at no cost due to Forest Service funding, I believe. Um, and so just briefly, it's permitted by APHIS PPQ, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service Plant Por Protection Quarantine, and they require a form called a 526 form. Um, and that you put in for it, or you talk to one of the biocontrol practitioners that's probably on this call or, or taking part in this summit, um, and they make sure that um, we're just bringing in agents that are permitted for release, um, and we work with our APHIS um, colleagues to make sure that we're abiding by those rules and regulations. I think that's a brief answer, but there is a lot more detail on that one on course. Okay. Not seeing anything else, Jen, I'll leave it to you for the take-home message and the closeout. Great. Thanks, Joey, and you did a great job moderating, so I appreciate that, the smoothness that it, uh, you brought to the summit today. So we want to thank you all, to all of our speakers for making time to share your interesting work and perspectives. 
We hope this summit highlighted the nexus of biocontrol and wildfire at the landscape level. Thank you again to the USDA Forest Service for sponsoring this summit and biocontrol committee members and NASMA staff for running everything so smoothly. This summit has been recorded and will be available on the NAESMA YouTube channel for later viewing. If you aren't a member already, please join NAESMA. All members are welcome to join the Biocontrol Committee. If you would like more information, please feel free to contact Joey or me or Phil Vile. We can put our information in the chat and then you can have our access to contacting us. Finally, thank you for joining today. We hope you have enjoyed the summit. Please take time to fill out the post-summit survey that you will receive shortly and have a wonderful day.